Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Clemens Kaminsky. I'm the head of the department here at Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology in Cambridge. I welcome you um, very much to this um, event, um, the Davidson Inventors Challenge, um, which is in memory of John Davidson, arguably one of the greatest chemical engineers ever to live, um, who was really a, a role model for many people, young and old, um, all over the world. Uh, and he would have been absolutely delighted uh, to welcome you all here himself. Um, he was very much interested in young, bright people um, doing great things. So it's absolutely wonderful to have this event here and, um, and see the future generation of great scientists. And I personally hope very much chemical engineers here in Cambridge um, participate um, in this event. I would like to start uh, by just briefly saying my thanks to Elena Gonzalez and her team uh, for organizing this wonderful event. Um, I should also say that Elena is today um, on her last day before she goes to on, on to maternity leave. So um, she, she, you get an impression of how committed she is to, to us and, and to, to everybody in the department. Um, I would also um, like to thank um, the many people who contributed to this, I would like to thank the ICME uh, and the Association of Science and Technology uh, in, in Malaysia, uh, and particularly Yunus Yassin, uh, an alumnus from uh, Chemical Engineering in Cambridge, who, uh, who helped us coordinate this um, in, in association with ASTI. Um, we have a number of very illustrious guests today. Um, we have Nadim Sahavi, who uh, you will have seen on the news um, uh, a lot um, um, in, in connection with, with the COVID deployment, the vaccine deployment. Um, we have the president of the IKME, Professor Stephen Richardson here. Uh, and we also have our brilliant alumna, Rachel Cook, um, who will um, tell about her experiences in chemical engineering. I don't want to hold you up too much. I would really like uh, to get started. I'm keen to hear what, um, what uh, the brilliant young um, students will have to say. Um, there were lots of entries. I think there were over 50 teams uh, in total. Um, and it was a tough selection process. I think over 150 students participated from schools. Um, and there were quite a, a lot of people involved in marking and, 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 and ranking these. And they had a hard time because the, the submissions were so, uh, so brilliant. Um, the theme was, um, uh, res, uh, was, was focused on the sustainable development goals. Uh, and that's pretty much what we as chemical engineers are about. We want to make the, the, the world a better place through the science that we do and the technology we invent. So very warm welcome to this. Um, I hope um, to see you at a later stage uh, in your careers um, at our department, um, but enjoy this afternoon. Uh, I am truly excited to finish my week uh, with, with, uh, with this exciting event. And uh, I'm passing over to the Director of Teaching in our department, uh, Dr. Andy Siederman. Andy. Thanks very much, Clements. I will hopefully share uh, my presentation there. Uh, so um, yeah, th thanks very much. And uh, thank you all attending as well, this inaugural uh, Davidson Inventors Challenge. And a special thanks, uh, as Clement says, to all uh, the groups from all the, all the pupils from all the groups uh, around the country who put in so much work into this uh, sustainable development challenge. So I'm here as head of teaching here in chemical engineering and biotechnology in Cambridge. And I've just got two slides to um, introduce what chemical engineering is and some of the things that we do. Um, and, uh, but I'm actually, I'm coming from this beautiful building that you can, uh, you can see here, although I am stuck in the basement somewhat. Um, so what is uh, chemical engineering? Well, it's, it's the science uh, and the engineering of making things at a, at a useful scale. Um, so a fairly useful uh, definition is that it's about converting raw uh, materials into useful products that uh, are made by different processes, um, but making them on an industrial scale. And in fact, more generally, we might think about it as converting something that's less useful into something uh, that, that's more useful. So this could be uh, include making a, a cheap, a valuable product from a cheap product, recycling things, turning waste into useful products or, or energy conversion. 
And an important concept in chemical engineering is the idea of scale. We need to be able to work out how to do things on a large scale or at least a useful scale. We need, we need to be able to produce things in, in useful quantities. Um, so the vaccine rollout that we'll uh, hear about uh, more about later is, is a great example of this. You know, the development of, of the vaccine was obviously a crucial step, but now making that in quantities to, to be able to vaccinate billions of people is a huge challenge for chemical and biochemical engineers like, uh, like we have here. Uh, so let's think about some of the steps. We're, we're often uh, we're thinking about using a raw, raw material of, of some sort. It, it may actually be the product uh, from another process, like a, a bulk chemical. This could be coming in various different states and maybe and different um, uh, different purities and different origins and so on. Um, so we need to understand about uh, material properties and, and uh, how to, to deal with those. Um, uh, you can, you can try and work out what that, uh, what that molecule is that you can see there. It's not really a raw material. That's actually a pharmaceutical uh, a compound of some sort. Um, and what we're trying to produce then, we're trying to produce uh, some products, which could be a whole range of different things. We might be looking at bulk or fine chemicals, which bulk would be things that you're familiar with, like um, I don't know, uh, um, sulfuric acid or, or acetone or something like that, um, which are often just precursors uh, to producing other products, um, or fine chemicals which are more expensive, more complex materials. Um, and of course, you know, would also include things like drugs and, uh, and other pharmaceuticals. I've just mentioned uh, vaccines. Um, but also it includes almost everything that's, that's around you, consumer goods and, and food and energy and so on. And I mean, you know, it could be the, if you just look around you, the, the sort of coffee you drank maybe this morning or the fibers of, of the clothes that you're wearing. Um, and I'm sure you're all, well, you probably sat down on a chair with some sort of materials in it um, that will have been through some chemical engineering process. You're sat in front of a keyboard and a, a screen of some sort. And all of these things um, a, uh, have had to be produced with the input of uh, chemical engineering. And so we need to think about the different processes involved in, in making these things. There will be synthesis, uh, reactors, you know, chemical, biochemical synthesis at the, at the center of some of these, but there's a whole lot of things surrounding that, which are an understanding of these processes, separating things, mixing things, um, materials processing, energy conversion, which are required to be able to, um, uh, to make these products that we're after. And of course, a, a key point uh, for us in chemical engineering um, is, is, the, is that it's vital to, to do this in a sustainable way where we're thinking about global environmental costs, maybe how energy can be most efficiently used, but also how where it's coming from, its source, or where we can um, tra transfer it from. Um, I've mentioned recycling, so you know, obviously using, uh, reusing things rather than creating extra waste. Um, and cleaning up things uh, from the past. I mean, you know, can we actually find ways to capture and store CO2 so that we can actually take it out of, of the atmosphere and help to solve some of the problems that um, have been produced in the past? So that's uh, a bit about what chemical engineering is. I've got one slide on what chemical engineers do, do on a more practical level, what's, what's uh, required from us. Um, well, so we can think about things, maybe we're looking at an existing process that is uh, in operation. And so what we need to be able to do as chemical engineers is actually operate that, um, ensure that it uh, continues running in, a, uh, in a, uh, an efficient way. But also sometimes things go, go wrong. And so in that case, uh, then we need to uh, think about uh, work problem solving, troubleshooting these systems. And we're always looking to improve them as well. So this could be improving, improving the sort of quality, the product quality or the purity of it, but also it might be using less energy or producing less waste for our system as well. Um, also, sometimes we're looking to produce something that, where the process itself doesn't exist. And so in that case, we need to consider design, which is a cru crucial part of chemical and biochemical uh, engineering. Um, so design, we can broadly put into uh, two different categories. Uh, so this is process design, and this is where the product is already known, and we need to design a process that can then produce the product on the, on the right, um, uh, right scale for the right cost. 
Um, but sometimes we don't even know what the product is that we want, and we just have to think about what, uh, what the requirements are, define product attributes, and then we can start to design a product and then uh, uh, bring in the process design uh, into it beyond that. Um, but one of the, so when we're doing this, whether it's doing product or process design, uh, there are various things we're going to have to include in that consideration, like uh, sustainability um, and environmental uh, impact, as well as safety and cost, uh, profitability of the design um, and, and other things as well. So there are a great deal of different skills that we need as uh, chemical engineers, biochemical engineers. Um, the basic knowledge, the basic tools that we're using probably are things like are pure science. So we're looking at physics, chemistry, biochemistry, materials, and so on, um, along with mathematics and uh, general engineering. So that's a range of skills, but we also need a, a range of other skills as well, which are, are more broad, like management and IT, maybe a bit of machine learning or um, economics, ent entrepreneurship, maybe foreign languages, if we're um, uh, thinking about uh, the, the global nature of this discipline. So I just want to finish off by um, suggesting a few reasons why you might actually think about studying it as a, as a degree subject. Um, uh, why would you want to do that? Well, I think it's a really interesting discipline. There are lots of different areas where you could uh, where you could find uh, interest in. You know, there are lots of different um, uh, areas of, of expertise that are required. Um, it gives you a really wide range of skills as well. So uh, you need lots of skills. So so the um, the course is designed to uh, to, to develop your uh, abilities in those areas. It's really not a restrictive choice as a uh, as a degree to do as well. It gives you lots of opportunities to become a chemical engineer, lots of different field work and research or, or, or management and so on. Um, but also outside chemical engineering, lots of students may go into things like uh, finance or, or management as well. But I think particularly with uh, today thinking about uh, the sustainable development challenges that people have been uh, working on. Uh, the other thing about chemical engineering is it also gives you uh, the, the chance to, to do something that is going to be useful to, to be, can be beneficial uh, for society. And so uh, I think that that's a, another really uh, important thing that, that chemical engineers have the ability to do these days is actually um, improve uh, the, the future for all of us. So at that I should uh, uh, and uh, there's lots more information if people want on the on the department website. I'm sure you can find that. Um, but I shall uh, hand over to uh, Cam Eunice now, who's going to tell us a lot more about the Davidson Inventors Challenge in particular. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, hopefully, everyone can see this. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cameron Yunus. I will be chairing this session this afternoon and really just, just really wanted to just go over some sort of key bits that, that you should know about what's going to be happening during this webinar this afternoon. So some important announcements. Uh, the, the, the whole webinar is being recorded today. Um, all the participants that are, have joined the webinar, your cameras and your mics should be off um, and the recordings will be available on the department website and YouTube channel uh, later on. So if anybody wanted to watch this after the, the event's finished, you will be able to have access to this. A little bit of another announcement, small announcement to all the presenters. So please do make sure your videos and mics are off unless you are presenting, um, because you do have the facility of turning this on. So please do pay attention to that as well. And one other really important thing, there is a Q&A feature in the webinar and all participants are encouraged to use the question and answer feature. We will be having our four finalists presenting shortly, and it would be nice if you had any questions to pose to the, uh, the finalists to, to use the Q&A feature to, to ask your questions. And I will then hopefully at the end of their presentations, try and pick some of those questions to ask them about those as well. So a little bit about what's gonna happen this afternoon. Um, you've already heard from our head of department and Andy Sidman, who's the director of teaching. Uh, after I've to finish just uh, going through the program overview, I will be handing over to Peter Davidson, who should, will be telling a little bit about Professor John Davidson and his career at, uh, at Cambridge in chemical engineering. Then around about half past three, we will kick off with our four finalists. Um, we will be, they will be presenting their research work and hopefully we will have an opportunity to ask them some questions at the end of their presentations. 
And around 4.30, 4 we will we'll be joining by Rachel Cook, who is one of the alumni in the department. She'll be talking about her career uh, and since she's graduated from chemical engineering, how that's progressed over the years. At this point here, we're gonna be taking a, a, a 15 minute break. Uh, this is really an opportunity for everyone to stretch their legs. And then we'll be starting again around four, five o'clock and uh, hopefully Nadeem Zahawi will be joining us then to, to present uh, some of his, uh, his sort, of, um, sort of experiences since graduating for, from chemical engineering. Um, um, one of the things I would recommend during the break at 4.45 to 5 p.m., please make sure your mics and cameras are off, but don't log off the Zoom call, stay on the Zoom call. And, and at five o'clock, we will, we will start broadcasting again. Um, and then after Nadim Zahabi is finished at 5.30, the president of the Institute of Chemical Engineering, Professor Stephen Richardson, will be giving a, a short presentation about the future of chemical engineering, and hopefully will also be announcing the winning team from the four we shall presenting today. So this will hopefully give you an idea of what's going to be happening this afternoon. Um, however, just uh, another slide here, just for some information. After the webinar, if you are interested in finding out more about the, the discipline and more about the department at Cambridge University, please do visit the, uh, our website. There's some uh, links here and some uh, contact details there. Please do get in touch with us if you have any further questions. So I'm gonna hand over to Peter Davidson now. We'll be telling you a little about Professor Davidson. Thank you. Uh, let's see if this technology works. Uh, I hope you can see that. Um, well, my uh, ambition in this, this uh, brief talk is to describe my father and um, uh, chemical engineering at Cambridge uh, over the years and why he was interested in what he did. Uh, and we're interested in this subject. Uh, so that's my father um, in his 20s. Uh, he came from a pretty modest background. His father, his father died about eight years after, the, after he was born, um, having served in the trenches. Uh, his mother was a primary school teacher um, and he went up to Trinity College, Cambridge in 1944 to read engineering. Uh, he always said he was lucky because Cambridge until about the 60s required uh, classics and his secondary modern school didn't do classics. Uh, he read engineering and one of the things that he always found interesting, as indeed I did when I did the same course some years later, uh, was that the engineering was a very general field um, and uh, he did quite well. He came top. He then went and joined Rolls-Royce for a couple of years. So he was working on the first uh, commercial jet engines, um, but uh, Rolls-Royce didn't stretch him enough. So he used to say he wrote his Trinity uh, Research Fellow dissertation in the evenings and standing up. In Rolls-Royce, you were seen to be doing work if you were standing up, but not when you were sitting down. And he joined the young department after doing a, a, a PhD uh, in 1952. Uh, and the department was recruiting, uh, as it does now, um, a, a mixture of engineers and scientists. It also recruits chemical engineers as well now uh, to its faculty. But um, uh, uh, the first uh, professor of chemical engineering wanted to have a, a talent and said uh, one of the best ways of learning the subject was to teach it. Um, anyway, uh, many years later, um, this is my father. He used to go into the lab every day. Um, this was in his 90s. Um, he went in the lab every day, aside from the last three months when he was a bit ill. Uh, he accumulated a variety of awards. He was past pre vice president of Royal Society, uh, a founder fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. And we were one of the three father and son combinations in that organization, which was really kicked off by Prince Philip. He's past president of the ICME and so forth. And he also won the Prince Philip Medal. Uh, so he shared that distinction with Frank Whittle, who discovered the jet or developed the jet engine uh, alongside some, uh, uh, well, uh, in opposition to some Germans. Um, he had 67 years in chemical engineering. Uh, I would describe him as a quiet, prudent optimist. Uh, he put in who's who his hobby of demanding of domestic artifacts. And I would say he was a believer of the parable of the talents. 
use what you are given wisely. And above all else, I think he had a knack and a passion for understanding the fundamentals of problems uh, and developing people organizations and giving them freedom to go their own way if they had good ideas and supplying some helpful thoughts if they had not. Okay, well, what got him into chemical engineering and, uh, originally? He started off with a, a pretty profound interest in fluid flow, which stayed with him, and, and I, I enjoy too, um, it's the swirls and eddies. And he used to say that he would let the water out of his mother's bath in Newcastle. It was, of course, cold water because they couldn't afford too much hot water. And look at the pattern of swirl as the uh, water ran out. And indeed, for his research fellowship dissertation, he produced some early relaxation methods for the shape of the flow um, if you had a free space below the bath. He, um, above all else, brought an interest into the fundamentals of diffusion and mixing. And if you think of what Andy described as chemical engineering and being able to scale things up, um, then for the bench scientist, then diffusion and heat transfer, the fundamentals of transfer processes, um, can be managed much more easily than if you have a huge reactor. And this shows uh, something my father worked on in Billingham uh, for ICI. So this is the largest fermenter that's ever been built. This was to make a uh, single cell protein and ICI had a world leading process for making methanol. And, and um, the, the process here was to take uh, a cheap product, methanol uh, and ammonia, which we also made, um, and to find the right bacteria to make protein for use as, as an alternative to fish meal. The Cod War had started at the time, so fish meal was expensive. Um, now, if you think of the, the problems in such a reactor, uh, actually mixing is very important. Too much methanol, too much ammonia in the local concentration kills your bacteria. Too little, and you don't get enough reaction. And so the diffusion and heat transfer and uh, mixing were key, as was sterility of that fermenter, because you've got uh, about a thousand tons of what might be classed as warm milk. And you can imagine if that goes off, you've got to get rid of it and it's all very expensive. Uh, and one of the things he and I collaborated on was the design of a system to pull materials out of that reactor whilst preventing bacteria from swimming back um, into the reactor itself. Um, what he was also uh, interested in was openness to mixing disciplines. Um, so he encouraged chemists and engineers to work together and later biotechnologists. And that mixing of disciplines is a crucial aspect to the Cambridge course uh, then and I think now and tends to lead to interesting breakthroughs. And the college collegiate system supports that because you're mixed with people on your staircase and buildings. And he also used to comment on the importance of tea breaks uh, to share ideas. And there were various stories about that. Those two things um, are quite useful these days. So one of the things that I'm proudest of now, and he would be proud of if he was all around, is uh, I managed this research site some years later, and we developed some uh, uh, reactor technology, uh, fermentation technology, which, and this part of the site was brought out by Fuji Film, is now being used to, ma to manufacture the Novavax vaccine uh, for COVID. He was also interested in looking after the planet, and together we um, uh, developed the uh, iChemy research event, which had become a bit moribund. And uh, I managed to convince uh, ICI, Shell, BP, various others, to fund a third of the research students doing chemical engineering in the UK each year to come along to this event. And the first event was held at Cambridge, and uh, uh, I wanted a decent speaker. And we got uh, Jonathan Porritt along, who said, as director of Friends of the Earth, um, it's all very well for people like him to talk about the need to do something about the environment. It's you lot 
that will actually provide the solutions. And an example of one of those was uh, a chap called Bacon, uh, who was self-funded, but my father gave him a home in the department, and he developed the fuel cell, which was vital to the Apollo program. So Bacon got a presidential medal for his work, because otherwise NASA wouldn't have been able to get men to the moon. And indeed, if Elon Musk has his way and sends people to Mars, they will depend on the fuel cell technology. Um, another thing that my father spent a long time on, and perhaps his, his greatest contribution to chemical engineering, was developing our understanding of fluidized beds. So a fluidized bed is when you pass uh, a gas up through a bed of particles. And if you pass the bed sufficiently quickly, the particles are lifted off by the uh, pressure on each individual ones. But you have a well-defined space in which they can uh, occupy. Because if they go above the bed, the gas velocity falls down and they drop down. So you have a porous uh, container at the bottom, blowing air or gas. And it's, it's useful for making uh, both better forms of petrol. But these days, it'll be useful to um, uh, generate hydrogen. And I vividly remember at seven o'clock in the morning, when I was about six, coming down and seeing my father looking rather pleased with himself, uh, because he'd worked out that a bubble in these fluidized beds, and you can see a bubble breaking the surface there, uh, a bubble in these fluidized beds, if sufficiently large, will go faster than the gas in the fluid bed itself. So gas in the bed just above the particle will go round and come back in again. And that explained beautifully why various people were having great deal of difficulty in making um, uh, large reactions from small reactors. Um, so that was a, a good example of some of his, his work. He also was heavily involved in the development of the profession um, and came out very strongly with the idea that chartered engineers should see modifications. He was appointed to the Court of Inquiry of the Flixborough disaster, which killed just under 30 people when the, uh, a plant um, on the uh, east side of the UK, making a constituent for nylon, blew up. Uh, and uh, he served effectively as a judge on the Court of Inquiry. And one of the root causes of that explosion was the fact that the modification, which was done very quickly, was not overseen by somebody with a basic understanding of engineering. So the whole idea of um, uh, plants should have high hazard plants, should be looked after by people which uh, who uh, have proper engineering training uh, came perhaps from that. He also sat on the Committee for Nuclear Safety and that oversaw the safety of our nuclear submarines, um, uh, about which uh, he never was always a bit reticent, uh, but uh, happened. Um, I'd like to conclude this by saying uh, one of his features was he had a a profound pedagogical vocation. He enjoyed the company of bright young students and staff, uh, and I would say they saw him as an approachable gentleman with very helpful insight and advice. Um, and uh, he and my mother um, had a couple of parties a year where students, uh, supervisees, were invited. Um, and it was always rather amusing to see them a bit surprised when they found um, that their bikes were better, uh, worked better after the visit than before. And he used to tour the northeast a bit to demonstrate experiments and to encourage people uh, to try for Cambridge. And I think he would have enjoyed talking to today's participants uh, and also perhaps provided some quick order of magnitude estimates of key parameters uh, to question you upon. So I hope I've given you a perspective both of chemical engineering and of my father. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for, for sharing your, your, your memories about your father. So we're now going to move on to um, get some of our teams to present. So first up, who is going to be presenting this afternoon is Ad Meliero. I hope I pronounced that correctly. So I'd like to uh, invite Ad Meliero team to, uh, to uh, unmute and uh, bring up their video feeds. Good afternoon, guys. So are you ready to share your, your presentations? 
Um, yeah. yeah. So over to you. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, can you see it? Yes, we can see your sort of slides. Brilliant, it's all up. Okay, um, good afternoon, we're Adam and Laura, and we're very excited to show our solution to the UN's 13th goal to you today. As our collective understanding of the consequences of human activity on the planet deepens, there's been an unequivocal push towards minimizing our adver adverse impacts on the environment. Whether at an individual, corporate or global level, our commitment to the earth is evident through our choices made and the practices adopted in our daily lives. Complications from the coronavirus pandemic have resulted in an incontrovertible shift in our global focus, from one of environmental concern to combating the immediate threat of the virus on humanity, with the negative reverberations of mass PPE production and its disposal becoming secondary consequences to a necessary good. The pandemic prompted the five of us to consider whether there was another way, a way in which would allow human protection without compromising environmental conservation efforts. Should another medical disaster confront humanity, would we be able to both effectively and sustainably tackle another such outbreak? In lieu of this, we began to theorise potential solutions to the problem of non-sustainable antiviral measures. In the spirit of killing the two proverbial birds with one stone, we got to work devising ways we could accomplish this balance. It should be noted that no birds were harmed in the making of this presentation. A principal concern involved with, a principal concern involved with the widespread prophylactic mask usage is the implications for the environment. Research into the usage of disposable masks suggests that the UK alone could be contributing 58.8 million non-biodegradable face masks to landfill daily, which have an average decomposition period of over 450 years. Therefore, in response to such shocking statistics, we felt compelled to tackle the UN's 13th goal of climate action. We approached this project with the main objective of minimising environmental impact and maximising sustainable practices at every stage from sourcing to distri distribu distribution, which further corresponds to the 12th UN goal of responsible consumption and production. With these goals in mind, we proceeded to brainstorm ideas for eco-friendly masks and methods, uh, methods to make them, and proceeded with actualising our idea of masks made from food waste. During lockdown, we researched methods to create materials out of food waste. Eventually, we were able to make materials out of orange peels, banana peels and old potatoes. Due to lockdown restrictions, we were unable to continue with our planned tests inside the lab. So we had to find creative solutions to standardise the comparison between the masks. To conclude, with, to conclude which biodegradable material would, have the most vi would be the most viable to replace disposable masks. We had five external volunteers review each type of mask and rate the texture and aesthetics of each mask out of five. We hope that this would help the results be more consistent as every person could apply the same scale between each type of mask. Based on the data we collected, the potato mask had the best texture and aesthetics. However, some of our volunteers had concerns with its smell caused by the vinegar used in its production. We took the feedback on board and decided to ameliorate the acidic scent by coating it with beeswax. This had the added benefit of enhancing the mask's hydrophobic properties. We also conducted objective tests to assess the integrity of the materials, focusing on their pliability and waterproof properties. Whilst all were waterproof with the additional coating, only the potato mask was highly pliable, which was an important feature as masks would need to be able to fit securely around the consumer's faces. Otherwise, respiratory droplets containing the virus can leak in and out around the edges of the mask. This is our prototype for our potato mask. As you can see, it is highly pliable around the consumer's faces and is securely wrapped around the face. With the easing on lockdown and the news that we had been shortlisted, we had the opportunity to conduct further research into our face masks. This included carrying out experiments to test the antimicrobial properties of the mask. This, um, we decided to test on three masks, a disposable mask, a Muslim mask, and our potato mask. 
Uh, we tested on the disposable mask, so we can compare its antimicrobial properties with our own face mask. And the purpose of the muslin mask was to act as a control. As muslin is a thin fabric, we would expect the bacteria to cultivate in the agar and act as a control to give us results to compare our potato and disposable masks to. Though we prototyped three different face masks, after receiving the feedback from our volunteers, the overwhelming consensus was that the potato mask is the most viable option. To test the antimicrobial properties of the mask, we cut each of the masks into four small squares. Then we placed one mask square into an agar plate and put 0.2 milliliters of the bacteria and luteus. Then after 10 minutes, we removed the mask square off the agar plate and into the beaker of disinfectant to prevent the spread of bacteria. We did this process with each of the three masks and each of the different bacteria cultures, M. luteus 1, 2, and 3. We chose to test the masks on M. luteus because this is a safe bacteria to use in a school lab, as it has an incubating temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, well below the body temperature. Furthermore, M. luteus is a yellow bacterium, and so it's more likely to be distinguishable from other bacteria that could have contaminated the agar plate. During this experiment, we followed aseptic technique ensuring all instruments were sterilized using a Bunsen burner. The lid of the agar plate was only partially open when necessary and disinfecting the surfaces and our hands before and after the experiment. After five days, we removed the agar plates from the incubator. As you can see on the screen, the muslin mask performed as we expected, showing that our experiment has provided us with reliable data. There was a significantly large area of spots indicating bacterial growth in all agar plates containing the muslin mask. The surgical mask and our potato mask performed the same in all bacterial cultures except M. luteus 2. This anomaly occurred due to the fact that the mask was accidentally dropped when transferring into the disinfectant. Therefore, this experiment is a good indicator that the prototype potato mask performed as well as disposable masks already on the market against bacteria. We then carried out some consumer research to investigate how many people would consider purchasing our mask. We sent out a survey to students in our school, asking them questions about how significant an issue climate change was to them, what type of mask they currently used, and if they would consider buying a mask made from food waste. We got over 120 responses, providing us with a large data set, which we could then analyse. 88.4% of our respondents said that climate change was a significant or very significant issue. Over one in four participants said they used a disposable mask, and the most common reason for this was convenience. 94% of our respondents said they would prefer to use a biodegradable and sustainable alternative to the disposable masks that are currently available, and an amazing 87% of our participants said they would be open to using a face mask made from food waste. This information was really useful to us as it shows that we are tackling a problem that young people feel passionate about, and also our solution is something that is needed and people would be open to trying it. When asked about how much they would, be, they would be willing to pay for a single biodegradable face mask, most participants said they would want the price to be no more than two pounds, although some people were willing to pay higher. Some participants mentioned that they would also be open to paying a higher price than the current disposable mask, as long as it offered the same protection. This was good news as based on our cost analysis, one face mask costs 80 pence to manufacture, which is within the budget of an overwhelming majority of our participants. Overall, we are very pleased with what we've accomplished during these challenging times. We believe that we've achieved all that we set out to do and more. Not only have we created a sustainable biodegradable mask that also supports local businesses, our mask even offers the same protection against bacteria as the current disposable masks available. Furthermore, we are very pleased with the feedback we've received both from our survey participants and our original five independent volunteers. Although more rigorous scientific tests are still needed, I hope that we've shown you the potential of potato face mask codes and would like to thank you all for listening and we welcome any questions you may have. <laughs> thank you very much guys for a very interesting presentation. I was quite impressed to see your prototype as well, which you've shown. Um, one question I have, how did you get that lovely green color? <laughs> all right, okay. And the other thing is you, you mentioned about um, the fact that these, the cost of manufacturing the mask is about ATP. Um, what sort of processes do you think you can introduce into the manufacture of these masks to bring those costs down even, for, even further? Um, when we were working out our cost analysis, we did it based on the fact that we would be purchasing potatoes from farmers. Um, that, that cost could um, be lowered if we got potatoes which um, farmers would normally like throw away or potentially supermarkets wouldn't take because they looked because of aesthetic reasons so we could get them at a cheaper price that would bring it down um, we could do the same with the other products that we use such as uh, the vinegar and also the um, what's the other thing um, the glycerin, the glycerin yeah. right. 
Okay, I can see there's another question that's come up from one of the panelists about efficacy. They want, they, the question they have is, what sort of pressure drop or particle removal would you see? So in terms of, you know, what, what have you, you've tested the mask for um, it, its sort of antibacterial properties. Um, what about in terms of breathability of the mask and, 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 and how much particles it would remove? How, have you managed to test for that or what sort of ways could you test for that? Um, we had planned experiments for the future to be able to see what its water resistivity because we realized that consumers would have it on their faces for the entire day. So they would be um, expelling like water vapor. So we were going to um, set up masks in front of um, steams and um, just seeing how um, the material will hold against the water vapor that would be received during the day. And um, we could do the same for breathability. We could have people try on masks for the entire day and mm -hmm. how they feel comfortable and like just um, ask if they can breathe during the day. Okay. And we planned to do that um, when we first sat down and did our Gantt chart, we planned with Space Incorporated for that, but then due to lockdown, we weren't able to get into labs. We obviously weren't able to do that. So when we were able to get into labs, our first primary thing was, you know, let's test the antimicrobial properties. And then unfortunately we didn't have time to test the, um, with the steamer and everything. But if we'd had more time, we would have. Yeah, so our results were quite reliant on like qualitative data rather than getting actual like numerical evidence due to like lockdown. But hopefully if we were to like further investigate this idea, we could get more um, reliable data that would like substantiate our finding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. There's another question uh, that's that's come um, that's been asked is um, what what kind of stability studies do they do you plan to do on your mask? So in terms of shelf life, so how what sort of shelf life do you think these masks would have? Um, so the masks contain glycerin, which biodegrades within 180 days. Um, so that's the shelf life of our mask. Um, it would last 180 days if you, but obviously it's single use. So once you've used it, it's intended to be thrown away. Um, in terms of shelf life, I think, like, are you talking more about how we would sell it or just sort of how long it would last? Well, I mean, it's sort of like how, how long it would last if you were wearing it. So, yeah, so it's sort of basically if a user was to use it, how, how many days could they use the mask for? Um, they could definitely use it in a day as they're, sing they're meant to be single use because we're combating the issue of um, disp single use disposable masks. Um, that's within what we, like, it needs to be able to work for a day and then they would throw it away or they could put it into their compost. Yeah. Okay, so no, another question. These questions are coming in quite fast now. So one question which is quite interesting. Are you aware of any similar products that are plant-based in the market now? And how would this potato based compare to those? Um, well, we found that since the coronavirus is like quite a recent um, issue facing like humanity, there hasn't really been that much um, research into using bio like degradable materials um, in like an antimicrobial sense. Um, however, we did like in our earlier research, we one of the projects we had originally like intended on um, investigating was the use of algae as a means of making biofuel. And from that, you could synthesize sort of like these bioplastics. So we had like um, seen quite a lot of um, recent innovations that other scientists had done, which um, focused around creating like fabrics from um, plant-based organic matter. However, I don't think we found any examples currently on the market, at least popular ones that um, like were similar to our idea. So I think we're coming to the end, but one more question um, that sort of one of the panelists has asked, using food for mask, do you see an ethical problem using food for mask manufacture? i.e. considering world hunger being a problem? Not really, because our entire solution is to combat the issue of food waste. So we're, we're all of our materials, especially the potatoes that go into making most of the masks, we, I, we want to source them from, you know, stuff that would normally be thrown away. Like the potatoes we used to make this mask, they were old. You couldn't really, like, aesthetically, you wouldn't really want to eat them. And we made a mask from that, which, which we think is quite incredible. Mm -hmm. And do you see this sort of technology moving on to using different types of food waste or uh, peels from different types of vegetables? Uh, yeah, previously we prototyped face masks using orange peels uh, 
bananas um, no, no. and old potatoes. Yeah, and so we can we can see this idea being used with other materials as well, considering that uh, it's not only potatoes that are being wasted. We think that this is a very viable solution to combating food waste. Brilliant. Right, I think we're now out of time. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you for everyone for, uh, for your questions. We're gonna now move on to our next presenters. So thank you guys. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, GeoBetter, which are a year 11 group from Sacred Heart High School in Newcastle upon Thames. So if you would like to turn on your camera and mics. Um, extinct by 2050. <laughs> Brilliant. We can, oh yes, so I can see you guys are here. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So whenever you're ready, make a start. Extinct by 2050. Temperatures are rising, ice caps are melting. The exponential increase of greenhouse gas emissions are rendering our planet uninhabitable. Small innovative steps can sustainably transform our world. So what are you going to do to save our planet. Good afternoon. We are GeoBetter, and this is our presentation on the Geo Battery. We have created a dystopian world fueled by finite resources. What do all of these pictures have in common? They capture the destruction caused by humanity's reckless use of fossil fuels. It is frightening to see how it has become an accepted norm. It is wrong that more than 1.3 billion people in poor communities must pay the environmental price for our lavish lifestyles as they are currently trapped on degrading our cultural land, increasing the vulnerability to drought and famine. Our team aims to solve these issues by tackling the seven sustainable development goal, affordable and sustainable energy for all. Our solution, one of the small steps to solve this problem is the geobattery. The energy, the electricity produced from the nanowires that is sheared from the bacterium Geobacter sulfuriducens. This creates an alternative to unreliable and expensive electricity produced from fossil fuels. It promotes clean, sustainable, and affordable energy, thus reducing the impact of global warming, aiding poor communities, and preventing the further destruction of agricultural land. This is how the geobattery works. The internal structure is comprised of seven devices of Geobacter nanowire biofilms. Since the biofilms rely on humidity, the optimum output of each device is 0.5 volts. If there's a decrease in humidity, this level drops to 0.2 volts. So to guarantee that the geobattery produces electricity, extra biofilms are added to ensure the consistency in the output of the geobattery. The nanowires are on top of a silicone plastic substrate to maintain their form. This substrate will be attached to the interior layer of the geobattery to prevent it from moving. Figure two shows that these devices will be fixed between two different sized electrodes. The top electrode, known as the anode, is shorter than the bottom electrode, known as the cathode. The size difference produces a vertical moisture gradient. This is because the moisture droplets are obtained from the surrounding air, which dissociates into hydrogen and oxygen ions, causing charges to build towards the top of the device. The gradient between the top and the bottom of the biofilm causes electrons to flow. With this, the geobacter nanowires can conduct electricity. All the devices will be wrapped in a spiral form to fit inside the battery. By using a spiral design, space is maximized and air can diffuse throughout the structure. The external structure of the geobattery is manufactured from stainless steel, which is a non-corrosive and 100% recyclable alloy. This steel layer will be created with micro tears embedded in the structure, which will allow for moisture to pass through from the humidity in the air. Figure five shows a flow diagram, demonstrating how the geobattery would work once placed in an appliance. Air will diffuse through the battery via the micro tears and a vertical gradient will be created. This will produce electricity and create a circuit in the appliance, causing it to function. Previously, we wanted to use the Geobacter bacterium in a microbial fuel cell, but it required a significant amount of the Geobacter 
to produce a sufficient amount of electricity. Therefore, we decided to use nanowires produced by the Geobacter to create electricity in a battery rather than a microbial fuel cell. So, what makes the geo battery original and innovative? It is affordable, durable, recyclable, small, mobile, and can be used as a substitute for AA batteries. Although microbial fuel cells use similar technology, geobacter nanowires have never been implemented in a battery form back there. As it can be seen, table one shows a comparison, comparison between the different types of batteries and our geo battery. Alkaline, lithium, and zinc all have their limitations, even though they can be rechargeable. Alkaline batteries leak corrosive liquids that could damage devices and be hazardous to the environment and people. Lithium batteries often result in a thermal runway where the temperatures quickly rise to lithium's melting point, causing a violent reaction. Furthermore, zinc loses 30% of its charge over time due to self-discharge, and this even occurs when the batteries are not in use. On the other hand, even though the geo battery needs further research into its longevity, it is safer than its alternatives as it does not use toxic chemicals which can harm the environment. The geo battery also only needs a constant supply of moisture from the humidity in the air. Our team has considered all the raw materials needed to manufacture the geo battery, the raw materials needed to package it, and the location for manufacture. We would manufacture the geo batteries in a low cost producing country, such as India, to be competitive in the battery market, as the resources are locally sourced and the cost of living is low. We have taken the average working days as well as the average yearly salary a person in India earns, which sums up the raw cost of the geo battery to 42 pence. However, including the packaging costs, the total cost of the geo battery is 64 pence. Comparing this price to our competitors who also sell AA batteries, the geo battery is the viable choice. If we considered selling the geo battery at 68 pence, lower than ever ready 74 pence, we would have a 6% profit margin, making it affordable for our target consumer. Therefore, these calculations show that the solution is more than competitive in the current market landscape. One significant drawback is that since the technology inside the geo battery is still in the developing phase, more research is needed to establish the nanowise longevity as it only has been tested for 10 months. Moreover, the geo, the geo battery has intricate inner structures. So the need for specialist machinery and specialist workers would make the manufacturing of the geo battery more expensive. However, further research into geo battery and the production of its nanowise could help us improve the energy efficiency of our product and streamline the manufacturing process. Initially, the factories producing the geo battery would release greenhouse emissions, but with further development, we will be investing in renewable sources of electricity, such as solar panels to power our factories. Furthermore, another benefit of the geo battery, its ability to self charge. Previously, we thought that the biofilms could conduct electricity for 20 hours, after which they will need five hours to recharge. But new research, shows that these biofilms can conduct electricity even in the five hour recharge phase, with the voltage only dropping from 1.5 volts to 1.3. The geo battery is also safer than its alternatives because it does not contain the toxic substances found in conventional batteries, such as cobalt and lead, which can harm habitats. It also means that recycling is made much safer and easier too. This helps keep the geo battery's life cycle cost low. Lastly, our invention is accessible due to Geobacter's ubiquity. It can be found in ponds, mud, etc. Since our goal is to help the poorest communities, our idea must also focus on the environmental and social impacts brought upon the manufacturing of the Geobattery in India. So we need to tackle the five Ps. People, manufacturing of the Geobattery provides well-paid jobs for physicians that would otherwise be at risk of severe underpayment in developing countries, such as factory workers. Planet, it provides another source of renewable energy for the world. This method can produce electricity in many conditions and does not contribute to the greenhouse effect. Prosperity, developing countries now have an accessible way to produce affordable and renewable electricity. It creates a path for economic development. Peace. When the geo battery is implemented on a large scale, we would be pre preserving scarce oil reserves and reducing conflicts over oil rights. Partnerships. 
our business would partner with local training schools and colleges to provide training and education to potential employees, which will in turn help the disadvantaged gain access to better job opportunities. This contributes to target 16 of the Millennium Development Goals to develop and implement strategies for decent and productive work for youth, as 47% of them are currently unemployed. Regarding the three Rs, the geobattery is a renewable source of electricity, so it would reduce the use of fossil fuels. Furthermore, the carbon footprint is reduced because the geobattery would travel less from India to surrounding developing countries such as Africa and South Asia compared to if it were manufactured in the UK. This in turn helps the environment as less CO2 emissions are released through transportation. Since the geobattery is self-charging, it can be reused many times. Moreover, all of our raw materials are recyclable. Currently, 98% of the batteries end up in landfills. Although the geobattery shows no sign of degradation, we aim to tackle the possible waste created by our invention through exchange schemes if it is proven that the geobattery has a shelf life. We would implement exchange schemes in kiosks so that they are accessible for communities. This would reduce the number of batteries ending up in landfills. It would also help the recycling process as the traded in batteries can be collected and properly recycled. So finite resources such as copper can be preserved. In conclusion, we believe our geobattery is a key solution to the seventh sustainable development goal because it produces sustainable energy and it is also affordable for developing countries. Since the bacteria used to produce the nanowires can be found throughout the globe, it will be easy for individual countries to produce the geo battery locally, allowing the products use on a wider scale. Therefore, we hope you can see how the geo battery is the small step needed to provide clean and affordable energy to sustainably geo better our world. Thank you very much, guys, for your very interesting talk. Um, I've just been looking through. The, there's been quite a few questions being posted on the chat. I'm going to start off by a question from one, one, uh, one of the other teams, Joe from Hydroponics. How do you get humidity, humid air flow to the battery, which is encased within a compartment in the product? Uh, that's an interesting question because we've implemented micro tears in the battery structure and so air can easily flow through the battery with these micro tears. And if you were using these batteries in an environment where the humidity is quite low, how do you solve that challenge? Um, it has been proven that it can be um, used in any humid conditions. So the optimum output is 40 to 50% of humidity, but it can either be, uh, it can even be used in the Saharan conditions. So 20% of humidity can be used and even 100% of humidity can be used. And the other thing is, um, what's your target market? So, and, you know, there, there's a question here about the, how does geobattery sort of reduce the current reliance on fossil fuels? So that really kind of broader question from that is where are your current target markets? Where do you see this battery being used and what applications? Um, when, when we first implement the geo battery, obviously we, like I said in our presentation, we'd be focusing on India um, and, and developing countries um, because they are the ones that we think would benefit most to start off with. But uh, if we're thinking in the grand scheme of things, we'd really like our, grand, our target is anyone. Um, because I think they can be easily used in everything um, in everyone's lives across the world. Any device that uses an AA battery can yeah. use our battery. Many appliances use double A batteries, and with future production of the geo battery, it can be used, for example, as triple A batteries or car batteries. So it's used for a wide scale. So, so, how do you solve the problem of uh, hum hum humidified environments with electronic components? Yeah. So if you've got a very humid environment that you need to maintain for your battery and you're putting it in your Walkman, how do you work around that problem? It's not because it would already be Just because of the neutral zone. Yeah. Um, just because, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to screen. It's not my own, it's, it's, it's like, I'll just be like, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, sorry, um, basically, 
it's not that being a humid environment would technically mean like there's physical water and it'd be enough to actually ruin electrical equipment because then that would mean computers right now would be in danger and they'd be probably malfunctioning. Um, so that's the same thing with our battery. It's going to be able to use that humidity that's already there in the air and use that to power itself. Okay, so there's one question that's been posed by Peter Davidson in the chat. I'm not sure if you read it. Um, it's really, um, could you explain the energy storage mechanism in your batteries? So what happens with the geo battery is that the nanowires are sheared from the bacterium. So uh, the, the nanowires itself conduct electricity. It does not need a storage phase because it naturally recharges after 20 hours. So in experiments, it has been proven that it uh, consistently produces electricity in within 20 hours and it's 0 0.5 volts each uh, nanowire device. So that's why we implemented many different devices. So if one uh, would drop in voltage, then there would be another appliance working and it can even, um, and it's also been proven that in its five hour recharge phase, it only drops to 0 0.35 volts. So it can be used in, in the, any amount of time. So just following on from that question, um, if it's the geobacter, um, your bacteria, which is your energy storage, really, what sort of mass, uh, unit mass per volume you need to, you know, what sort of uh, mass you need to get per, per your, your kind of power? I mean, how much does it need to be? What sort of mass of geobacteria you need? Oh, right. right. Um, yeah, so uh, you wouldn't need a large amount of uh, the bacterium because over a, a period of time, the once the nanowires are sheared, it's extracted from the bacterium itself. And these nanowires naturally form a biofilm of 10 micrometers thick. So it, it wouldn't need a large amount of the ba bacterium. It would simply just depend on it would simply just depend on how many batteries you are making. If we're talking about one, then obviously just that amount. But then more you need. Um, you you would only ever need more bacterium if the amount is already. Yeah. Kind of so, so if I had an AA battery, um, would your geo battery would be a similar size to that, or would it be bigger because you need to pack in more bacteria? It'd be the exact same size. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so it's invoice. the same size. We've made yeah. it the same size, so that devices themselves wouldn't have to be recreated, yeah. and so it would be yeah. more easy to be um, implemented used throughout yeah. the world. Yeah. Um, so, so you have to a... buy the battery, and then you can put it straight in your device, which you used to previously use other ones. Yeah, yeah. exact same, same dimensions, dimensions and everything. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there's lots of questions coming up on the post right now, but unfortunately <laughs> we are out of time, and I'm going to be sticking to time strictly here. So. Thank you for your questions, but that's something for you guys to read and think about uh, while the other teams are presenting. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you. So we are now going to move on to our next team, which is Hydroponics. There are year 12 students at Brighton College in Brighton. So over to you, Joe. Um, hi, I'm Joe from Hydroponics. And since all our members of the team are scattered across the globe, we've decided to pre-record our presentation. So uh, I'll play that video now. Um, we look forward to answering your questions afterwards. Sorry, there seems to be a bit of difficulty because um, the Zoom format is different when... Uh, for no some problem. problem. Are, you, are you going to be able to get it up? Yeah, give me one second and I'll get it up. Not a problem. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, let me just do it. Brilliant. So. The toughest part of our project like this is knowing where to start. Our endless research saw us eventually focusing on the rural areas of sub-Saharan Africa. 
We were amazed to discover that there's over 300 million people down there who don't have access to clean drinking water. And it's literally killing over a million kids every year. For perspective, that's four times the population of Brighton dying every year due to contaminated water. So to us, this seemed to be the kind of issue that would be really worth trying to solve. One of the first things that hit us when we started looking into it was how practical and hard working many of these people are. With diverse skills, including woodworking, metalworking, mechanics, all these skills, yet they've still got these massive problems they can't solve. So we decided the best thing we could do would be to apply what we've learned about science, engineering, and maths to try to design some products which could help solve these issues. But very early on, we identified a really important guiding strategy. What we didn't want to do is come up with some kind of complicated product which would have to be made in some factory and shipped out to the developing world. What we really wanted to do was design the products then generate detailed instructions which would enable these enterprising Africans to put them together themselves, using materials salvaged from whatever rubbish happens to be lying around their village, for virtually zero cost. So that's our plan. This has been our guiding principle. We call it empowerment over charity. And we believe that's how you really help people in the long run. So the concept of using a large parabolic dish to focus the sun's rays in order to cook or heat water isn't new. But when we researched the existing options on the market, we found that they're generally bulky, expensive, and environmentally insensitive products that have to be commercially manufactured and exported the target regions. So we set about redesigning the solar system from the ground up. We quickly identified that our primary source of material would be steel oil drums, which can be found lying around most villages and small towns across Africa. So firstly, the process involves cutting the drums into sections and then rolling out the side panels into strips, which then have holes drilled through their centers and at the ends. These slats are then fixed together through the midpoints with an anchor screw and fanned out to create a large, flat, reflective surface. We then describe a technique for shaping the flat surface into a parabola of the appropriate geometry, locked into place by simple connectors. We prototype this idea using cardboard and staples to create a one to six scale model and we're delighted by the rigidity of the resulting shape, and it went exactly as we predicted. We then needed to design a frame which would support the dish and enable it to be tilted to take the maximum advantage of the sun at different times of the day. So after considering a range of more complex options, our ultimate solution was a basic structure which allows the dish to be rotated whilst maintaining heating vessel at the focal point. This can be adjusted and secured simply by means of knotted strings either side, where the knots are placed at half hour intervals. So whilst we were designing the solar cooker, we had to undertake a number of mathematical calculations. Our starting point was to assume that our device should be able to heat a liter of water from room temperature to boiling point under usual solar conditions in less than three minutes similar to boiling a kettle at home. We first had to undertake some geometrical calculations to ensure we were capturing sufficient solar radiation within the dish. We then had to work out the correct curvature of the dish to ensure that our captured radiation would be suitably focused on the cooking vessel at all times. Wait, was that a bit too quiet? Finally, we had to undertake the thermal calculations for the heating vessel itself. We were very pleased to find out that the performance of a parabolic dish, whose size is defined by the diameter of a standard oil drum, almost exactly matched our criteria. A dish of 1.6 meters diameter should heat a liter of water from room temperature to boiling point in 215 seconds. Perfect. There's no doubt in my mind that our solution for a solar cooker is more innovative, more practical, more portable 
more effective, but critically, at much lower cost than any others on the market. And it's widespread use across Africa, which significantly reduces dependence on charcoal for cooking fires, leading to a major reduction in both deforestation and carbon emissions. Of course, the solar cooker was just the start. What we really wanted to do was come up with a solution for providing clean and safe drinking water. In the end, we came up with two different solutions. The first method works by using the solar cooker to boil and evaporate dirty water. We then capture the steam and condense it to provide fresh drinking water. We managed to successfully design the system, again using fully recycled, widely available materials. The main advantage of this technique is that it's able to remove virtually all impurities, contaminants, stains, and dissolved salts. So it produces extremely pure water. But when we got to doing the maps, we hit a major stumbling block. If you imagine a kettle on your stove, it usually takes just a couple of minutes to bring the water to boiling point. But if you leave it there steaming away, it could take hours for all the water to disappear. The reason is that it takes more energy to turn water into steam than it does to simply heat it up. It's called the latent heat of evaporation. We knew that before we started, but we didn't appreciate the magnitude of the problem. Using this steam method, we calculated our solar cooker would only be able to create around 3.2 liters of fresh water per day. That might be enough for a survival situation, but it's definitely not enough for family home. So we decided to come up with an alternative design which would generate far more fresh water. Again, we heat the water using the solar cooker, but this time, instead of evaporating it, we'd use a thermally activated valve to release water of a sufficient temperature directly out of the heating vessel into a collecting vessel. We did a couple of calculations and they showed an almost tenfold increase in the amount of drinking water at 24.9 liters per day. The resulting water may contain some residual coloring and taste from the original contaminant, but we assure you it should be perfectly safe to drink. Okay, so that's where the project's got to so far. We designed the three products, the solar dish and the two methods of water purification by steam and by um, simple boiling. We've done all the theoretical calculations. We've made a simple prototype of the dish. We've gone into great detail about how these products can be made out of the specific items of trash. And we've even made an assessment of the lifespan of the products and their maintenance requirements. From here, for the remainder of the presentation, we want to tell you about where we envisage the project going, uh, the steps we need to make in order to turn this into a reality, and a few of our other various ideas on those subjects. So we hope you'll stick with us. So our first ambition is to get a full-size working prototype built here in the UK. We've already approached an engineering company and a local forge who are ready and willing to do this work at relatively low cost. If we are lucky enough to get sufficient sunshine and brighten at any point during the summer, we should be able to test how the performance of this prototype measures up to our theoretical calculations. From there, we should be able to produce the first draft of our manufacturing construction. Next, we want to start build testing. We've already reached out to two villages in Africa, one in Namibia and the other in Tanzania, and they're both keen to get involved. Once we've done the full scale prototyping, our next move will be to send the manufacturing instructions out to Africa to see how the local people get on with making the product. We will then take on board their feedback to constantly tune and improve the manufacturing instructions until we're sure that we've really got it right and we're ready to roll out. From there, we went to marketing and publicity. How do we get these manufacturing instructions out to the people that need them? These days, everyone's got mobile phones, even in remote villages in Africa. So it should be possible to reach these people. We just need to figure out the best way to do so. 
Although we reckon that, once they've proved their worth, news of these products should spread quickly from village to village by simple word of mouth. But we've been thinking that it might also be a good idea to partner with some kind of philanthropic organisation to help pay for some marketing. That could be real world or online advertising, or we could even send our representatives out on a roadshow around the various villages to get things off the ground. So, in case you haven't noticed, they call this whole thing poop. Obviously, because the main element is the sort of poop. Also, because helping people to make useful products out of trash is a bit off the wall, a little bit poopy. Helping these people to help themselves, empowering them, we're really keen on them too. Going forward, we also want to expand the range of products to solve other problems. For example, we started this whole project by thinking about small scale hydroponic farming in Africa. So it would be nice to return to that idea and come up with complementary solutions for utilizing the freshwater production facilities we've already created. Our overall mission is to track down opportunities where academic knowledge can be combined with the practical skills of local people to help them build effective, ultra low cost products designed in Brighton, built in the world. Hi, uh, sorry about any lag there, but we, we tried our best. That's okay. That seemed to work quite well. I heard the whole video. Thank you very much. Okay, we've had a few questions come in. I think one question, the first question which came in is the dish needs to ref be needs to reflect need to have reflective properties compared to expensive dishes out there. Um, uh, you know, you're suggesting to use oil drum to provide this. Is this possible to do to get those sort of reflective properties from those sorts of materials? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was sort of in charge of the comp looking at the components. So I guess I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so if you use the inside of an oil drum, it's already relatively reflective, not very, but it's quite easy to use um, either pumice stone, so natural materials lying around to polish the inside, or you can use, um, if the village is lucky enough to have sort of a local forge or workshop, there will be uh, basic methods that won't require any sort of manual you know, factory uh, work. Hmm. So this kind of leads on to the question uh, from another panelist. Um, the first thing they ask is, have you looked at John Taylor's solar cooker? It's a parabolic dish for cooking sterilizing water. Um, have you come across that before? So, yeah, so in one of our appendices in the uh, project, we do look at um, a range of the existing products. And we came briefly across John Taylor's or something similar to it. Mm -hmm. And as we said in the presentation, our whole, um, our whole product was sort of guided by the principle of empowerment over charity. So John Taylor's um, or something similar to that is very difficult to make out of in a village, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, it'd be very difficult to make, um, you know, with the uh, sort of with the materials that it requires. So we decided that if you can make it more basic and easier to build out of rubbish, that would be ideal. Mm -hmm. that, that sort of leads on to the next question. How would you, one uh, have quality control on dispersed manufacturing? So if you're going out asking people to use whatever scrap materials they have, so how do you go about maintaining quality control? Yeah, so... Um... That's something we wanted to move on to next about with regarding field testing and things like that. So we need to draft our first set of instructions, which is effectively where we come in, providing us the science and the uh, validation for the product. So we would really need to um, have send instructions over, have um, people build them um, and then see where the issues come up. But the what we like about this uh, the product is there's there's quite a lot of room for uh, like change so you can uh, the product can change from person to person but the general um, idea of the systems still stays. I mean that sort of you mentioned about validity you know validating the the, the setup. Um, so you know what sort of tests would you envisage doing to to see this, uh, how effective the setup is and how pure the water is that's coming out. Okay, well, obviously, one of the main uh, tests would be like the volume of water output. Um, that would be quite a key one. Then for drinking, uh, 
for measuring how actually safe the water is to drink. We, they, you, can, um, you can trust the assumption quite strongly that if the water is getting up to, to a high enough temperature, then it will be sufficiently killing the bacteria. But um, as we say, if you want a more advanced way of testing, um, testing the purity of the water, it may be necessary to maybe go to, for example, Johannesburg or uh, Windhoek, you know, a, a neighboring larger town or city to, um, you know, get some help from someone with a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more, like, uh, you know, uh, technology. Yeah. And there's a couple of more questions here. Uh, I think we'll finish on that. This is the last question. Someone's asked, you know, what other what other materials are used to make the rest of the purification system? And there's a question also been asked about how do you guarantee safe operating conditions? So has there been much thought given to that? Okay. Well, I'd yeah. like to take one question okay. because I was in charge of the uh, the steam vessel and the calculations involved. And that's a great question, actually, because in our one of our appendixes, we actually mention that we do consider safety as one of the very high priorities of our product design. And so for this product, the safety issue is not actually with the temperature, but rather with the pressure, because the steam vessel is a potentially really high pressure device and it has a really great potential for leakage. So, you know, our components and our connectors all have to have a really, really high level of integrity. And as the internal pressure builds, we actually have a simple flap of rubber affixed to the outside, and we call that a spigot. And so the pressure lifts it up and provides steam release under the high pressure conditions. And the reason why the temperature isn't as high of a risk is because we have uh, cooling tanks. So we have water running along the outside of the steam vessel, which obviously caused the exterior down. So the pressure is our main concern, but that's obviously been addressed. But yeah, thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you very much, guys, for your presentation. Uh, I think we need to move on because we're running a little bit behind time now. But thank you so much for your presentation. Thank so you. moving on to the final um, team presenting, which is I, I've been told it's, it's SEAM. Is that correct? That's what the team's called, SEAM. Scheme. Scheme. <laughs> scheme, sorry, yes. So scheme are a year 12 group from South Hampstead High School in London. So over to you guys for your presentation. Uh, one second. Yep, one second. We're just um, sharing our screen. No problem. Yep, um, can you see our screen? We can see your screen. Okay, okay. Right. One second. Hi, we are Scheme. I'm Christina. And I'm Emma. I'm Samantha. And unfortunately, our two other members, Esme and Maisie, couldn't be here today because they're on GOV, but they wish they could be with us. We have designed the Pan Oxy. It's a unique pulse oximeter that aims to tackle the racial bias within medicine. The specific problem that we will be addressing is the racial bias in pulse oximetry and its harmful effects. So first of all, what is a pulse oximeter? It's a piece of medical equipment used to estimate the SpO2 or oxygen saturation of a patient's blood. The pulse oximeter probe, usually pl placed around a finger, fires two wavelengths of light, 660 nanometers, which is red light, and 990 nanometers, which is infrared radiation, through the finger of the patient. The receiver on the other side measures the amount of light that is transmitted or absorbed. So the oxygen saturation is calculated based on the fact that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood absorb different amounts of each type of wave. For example, oxygenated blood absorbs more infrared and lets more red light pass through and vice versa for the deoxygenated. So for each wave, there is two components, the AC and the DC. AC occurs when the wave passes through pulsating blood and DC occurs when it passes through things such as stationary tissue. As you can see in our diagram, this ratio is calculated by doing the red light absorption over the infrared light absorption. And then this ratio calculated is then used in the lookup table, which has a corresponding oxygen saturation level. And the, the only issue here is that the lookup table was based on clinical trials, which primarily use Caucasian subjects and therefore would not be accurate for darker skin patients. 
And this means that as darker skin contains more melanin, it absorbs more light and as a result, pulse oximeters overestimate the oxygen saturation by up to 2% in darker skin patients and this occult hypoxia, which is the body shortage of oxygen 12% of the time. And this can be incredibly dangerous, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic due to the high dependence on pulse oximeters to monitor the health of patients as they detect silent hypoxia, which is a symptom of COVID-19. It also means that darker skin patients with dangerously low oxygen levels may be presumed to be healthy and only if they physically show a much more severe effect than white patients whose readings are more accurate can they qualify for the same treatment. And the impact of this is particularly significant as BAME patients are more susceptible to COVID-19 and are therefore more likely to suffer from hypoxia. And therefore the healthcare desperately needs to be tailored towards those who are vulnerable not against them so that they are given the best treatment possible. And as you can see in this diagram, which shows the paired measurements of the SpO2 levels in a typical pulse oximeter, although white patients had higher arterial oxygen saturation than black patients, the pulse oximeter actually overestimated the level of black patients, showing them as being higher instead of being lower than the white patients. So what is our solution? The panoxy. It's a pulse oximeter which accurately measures SpO2 levels for a range of skin tones. The attached skin sensor will identify the Fitzpatrick skin type of the patient and then direct the oximeter to the data lookup table. Separate um, data tables would be stored in the oximeter for each skin type. And then this means that the displayed results are specific for each skin type and it avoids any overestimation. Because of this, the pulse oximeter is the first of its kind which is calibrated to provide accurate measurements for patients of all skin types. In addition, by measuring the changing transmission of the two wavelengths with each heartbeat, the panoxy monitors heart rate and pulse strength of the patient as well. The panoxy also has a stand that the finger probe can be used on, and this will help stabilize tremors, possibly in elderly patients as shaky hands decrease the accuracy of the reading. So what is our method of solving the problem? We would have to collect data from different skin types in order to calibrate the panoxy with different lookup tables. This data would ideally be collected through partnering with hospitals to test our products. And, and this is perfect for us as many patients in the critical care wards are routinely checked with a blood gas reading taken from an indwelling arterial line. We would take blood gas readings for O2 levels in each patient and then use the delayed data collected to calibrate the panoxy. We would also use a large sample with a range of skin types to ensure that our readings would be as accurate as possible and record data for each skin group. However, due to COVID-19, this may not be possible. And therefore, an alternate solution is that we can estimate values from already existing data collected in scientific trials measuring overestimation of oxygen saturation levels in darker skin patients. We will now explain how the panoxy fulfills the five P's of sustainability. People. The panoxy would benefit people by ensuring adequate health care for patients of dark skin. This is especially important as it has now been proven that racial bias within pulse oximetry increases at lower oxygen saturation levels, for example, in the 70s, which could be fatal if not detected and treated. Additionally, the panoxy will also aid people with reduced hypoxia ventilator response who are more likely to die from hypoxia and provides a level of reliability for SpO2 measurements, which is unmatched by its competitors. So next we have the planet. Platinum silicon is used for the outer cover, which is extremely durable and long-lasting. And it's also non-toxic when dumped in landfill or the oceans. PLA, the hard casing, is a polymer formed from lactic acid. This is biodegradable and composts into chemicals less toxic than the alternative 3D printing filament, ABS. The fact that PLA can be 3D printed allows us to produce the oximeter casing with little waste plastic. Lithium batteries are the most efficient alternative to using energy from fossil fuels and therefore will also reduce the carbon footprint of the panoxy. However, lithium extraction can have a negative impact on the surrounding ecosystem. Prosperity. Prosperity. The cost benefit analysis of the panoxy has shown that the accurate results will save the cost of emergency treatments in the long term by identifying respiratory events earlier. Furthermore, the panoxy ensures that all patients receive the treatment that they pay for. Peace. The panoxy does not have a direct impact on world peace. However, it could be argued that it works to reduce some of the societal disparities like racial bias that underpin a huge amount of conflict internationally. 
And finally, we have partnerships. The Panoxy has been designed to be an internationally marketed product with a specific focus on being promoted in countries where most of the population is on the darker side. We will also partner with hospitals around the world to implement the use of the Panoxy so that we can improve the healthcare of patients internationally, not just the UK. Lastly, we aim to develop software so that data from the Panoxy can be uploaded to the NHS X app, which is currently being used by doctors to monitor patients who are not able to stay in hospitals and have to be in home wards. Our purpose. So by using our product within hospitals, more lives will be saved as darker skin patients will not be at risk of inaccurate results while their respiratory health is being monitored. And the Panoxy aims to ensure that the safety of people who are part of the Bane group and is prioritized to, to allow doctors to detect respiratory diseases at an early stage. The Panoxy attains to SDG3 as it benefits the general health of those who are part of the Bane group. It keeps them safer and reduces the risk of Bane patients not receiving the care they need. The Panoxy also attains to SDG10 as our product ensures that people in minority groups get the medical attention they deserve and that they are not in any way at a disadvantage when it comes to pulse oximetry. So by carrying out tests and gathering a substantial size of data, we as a team will be able to improve and tweak our product to fit people's needs, meaning it is extremely effective and will really benefit people's lives. In the end, we would aim to send the Panoxy to all medical wards to do with, wards to do with respiratory diseases so that they can get the treatment they need immediately. By taking it internationally, we will also be able to impact many more people. So some of the innovative elements of our design include a stand, as mentioned before, to stabilize the patient's hand. And in addition, the Panoxy is the first pulse oximeter with an integrated skin tone sensor to accurately calibrate the oximeter and tackle racial bias. And the key benefits of our solution is that it removes racial bias from pulse oximetry makes readings more accurate and ensures the safety of all patients. And in addition, by reducing the risk of darker skin patients suffering from hypoxia without medical attention, this can relieve hospitals and reduce the number of patients looked after in wards, as early detection can prevent the disease from developing into a fatal and serious matter. So we hope that you enjoyed our presentation. Uh, we truly believe that the panoxy will make a huge impact in reducing the racial bias within the medical profession by giving everyone access to adequate healthcare, regardless of their skin color. And we want to answer any questions that you guys have. Brilliant, thank you so much team for your presentation. Uh, I can see there's some questions posted already. Um, first question is about, are there any current technologies like this on the market? And if there are, how does your, your suggested invention uh, compete or improve? Okay, so currently hospitals are using um, pulse oximeters um, that have been yeah. developed for yeah. quite a while, it's been around. But um, ours differ because that we have a integrated skin tone sensor that can calibrate the oximeter to suit people with different skin colors to make sure that it is, the readings are accurate. Um, yeah, so there's nothing else like that right now. And actually a lot of the time they're not checking if these pulse oximeters even work, 95% of patients aren't being checked for this and it's actually becoming a really big problem. Yeah. So one of the questions that uh, one of the attendees has posted is why can't the standard uh, devices be calibrated to be more accurate? Um, I think it's because of the lack of clinical testing and clinical trials on um, um, yeah. like a wider variety of skin tones. So we do not have the data. Oh, so it's not like a very yeah. known about issue because we were talking to a few of our friends who had doctors as parents and they were saying they were completely unaware that this was even a thing so um, also I think the issue is that none of them have got this integrated skin tone sensor and without it you can't find the skin tone which then will calibrate them and that's what's missing because you could sell a pulse oximeter that is for a certain type of skin tone but we want one that applies to everyone which isn't available at all so, and then in terms of um, the, the, the error due to skin tone, how, 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 how much is the error there? Is it, is it substantial? Uh, yes, I think from previous, previous research, I think um, darker skin patients um, get um, overestimated three times more likely than white patients. So that yeah. is quite a big number, thinking that there's quite a large number of patients in each hospital. And also, as we said, it also happens when the percentages are really low in the 70s. And that's when someone's like about to die, which obviously needs to be addressed. So it's quite a serious issue. Yeah. 
And last question now, because we're, we're kind of coming up to the end of time. What is the cost comparison of the oximeter with, uh, with and without the added skin tone um, meter? Um, so our added skin, added skin tone sensor would cost around between 50 and 70 pounds. And then the additional technology would cost around 20 to 30 pounds. And that would be just the extra cost that would be added. But we would also try and use a higher quality of materials than the ones that are being sold right now on the market for around 30 pounds. We'd be looking around more in like, I'd say like 100, 200 pounds. But yeah, we had an estimated figure of like 200 pounds. Oh, there's lots more questions coming in, but I think we're out of time now. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank um, you. And I'm now going to ask um, Rachel Cook to come online to give a, give a talk as well. And while Rachel's coming online and getting her presentation set up, uh, just an announcement for all the reviewers, please do post your scores on the Google Sheet for us to review for all the presentations. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me, you can uh, see me and you can see my screen. Great. Yes. Thank you. So hello everyone, I'm uh, Dr. Rachel Cook. I'm uh, an alumni of the Chemical Engineering Department at the University of Cambridge and also one of the judges for this award. And what I want to tell you about in the next 10, 15 minutes is a little bit about my career in chemical engineering and really just to give you an idea of what your future could look like. So uh, I went to uh, Cambridge, I graduated in uh, 2000 after having done A-levels maths, further maths, physics, chemistry and general studies and AS in electronics. I, uh, I obviously knew um, Professor Davidson. I was I was also at Trinity and I also graduated top in my final year. So two things in common, at least. Uh, after I finished chemical engineering, I, um, my, my, my master's, I went on and did a PhD in viscoelastic fluids because I found uh, the way that non-Newtonian fluids flow really interesting. And my PhD was actually uh, had an application in the fracking of oil wells, which is very, very topical. Um, and really, this was what my passion for chemical engineering was. I loved maths, I loved physics, I loved chemistry. I grew up in the northeast of England, and you can see a photo of this. Uh, this is a chemical plant by night. I thought it looked kind of exciting. Uh, and then I did my work experience with ICI, Imperial Chemicals Industries, uh, ExxonMobil, more oil and gas, and my PhD was sponsored by Schlumberger. And this kind of represents where chemical engineering came from in many ways, the, the oil and gas industry. But then I got sidetracked um, in, my, in my career because I actually love chocolate. Uh, so after I'd left Cambridge, I then uh, joined Cadbury. Um, and I guess we all know who Cadbury are. And uh, I, I just loved working in that environment. And I think when you, when you look at what your career is going to be, I mean, it's very hard to see what the future opportunities will be, but to think about what you like, uh, what your values are, and what's most important to you. So I wanted to work uh, in a company with similar uh, values to mine. I also wanted to travel. And uh, after having worked on an oil refinery um, for ExxonMobil, the idea of working in chocolate, which to be honest, if you get it on your hand, it doesn't burn you and you can just lick it off. Yes, you have to wash your hands, right? But you're not dealing with nasty, dangerous chemical spills. You're dealing with a little bit of chocolate that you have to scrape up. So I really um, enjoyed my time at Cadbury. I spent 10 years there. I lived in three different countries, worked in many more different sites. I, I did a whole range of roles. I joined on a graduate program. So putting in new processes to make, uh, to make chocolate, putting in new systems, spent some time uh, actually buying fruit and nut for, for all, of, all of the UK and Ireland, time on the production line. Uh, I was part of the team developing uh, low sugar Maynard's wine gums, which sadly aren't around, but actually the whole process of creating new products is very exciting. And I also spent time in Poland building new chewing gum and chocolate factories and uh, working on new product innovation. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Next, but I had a, did a lot of chemical engineering in, in my time at Cadbury. 
And then I had the opportunity to join a company called SAB Miller UK, uh, which SAB Miller is South African breweries Miller. Uh, and they were the world's second largest brewer of beer. I'd never heard of them when I got the, you know, would you like to apply for this job note? But I did, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. I had a global role, um, basically called manufacturing development, which is all about implementing uh, the latest in industry 4.0, the internet of things, and also the sort of best practices lean um, from, the, from Toyota and so on, implementing this globally into breweries and soft drinks plants and maltings uh, around the world. And that, that had a lot of travel with it, a lot of interesting thoughts, leadership, a lot of challenges that we were overcoming. And then in 2016, uh, SAB Miller was bought by Anheuser-Busch InBev and I went and joined Amazon, which I guess also needs uh, no, no introduction. And I, on my second role uh, in Amazon, I now live in Luxembourg. And my first role, I was part of the team that built and equipped the new warehouses for Amazon. Uh, so I ran a number of central engineering services to support them uh, in terms of getting the money approved, the standards, the change management, managing vendors, and, and the commissioning process. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, I moved into reliability engineering, which is all about making sure the equipment doesn't fail. So although I have, I'm a chemical engineer, I had a very varied uh, career, done a lot of different things. I've deliberately chosen not to specialize in something and to really go and choose to work for companies that are growing and doing interesting things. And just as a, a little side note uh, on my voluntary work, uh, even when I was at Cambridge, I used to go and run an after-school science club at a local school. I'm one of the founding members of Cambridge Hands-On Science. And uh, I've always had this passion to, you know, inspire the next generation into science and engineering, which is probably why I've given up my time to support this project. And I, through that, though, I've managed to um, be very much involved with ICME, the Institution of Chemical Engineers, uh, I became a fellow, um, but I also ran their food and drink special interest group for six years and was on their UK board. And I'm still a uh, judge of their, their global awards. And I'm also a founder of the Cheltenham Science Group, which is a hands-on science center at the moment in, in Cheltenham. So I've continued to have a career, like a side career or a hobby uh, doing other things. So this is what my CV looks like, but it doesn't really tell you about the highlights. So I just wanted to show you some of the, the highlights and I think the best way to show you what the future could hold is through some pictures. Uh, so the picture on the top left, uh, that is the oldest brewery in Africa. It's Newlands in Cape Town, as uh, Table Mountain in the background. And you know, I was there on a work trip and it was uh, a fantastic time um, to go to Cape Town several times, obviously put in some holiday, business class flights paid, uh, and yet, you know, very valuable from a working point of view and a personal point of view. Then the middle picture is something I guess you can't plan for, but I was working for Cadbury when they sponsored the London Olympics. And so um, with a, a gold medalist in the Paralympic cycling, uh, I actually was able to sell ice cream and chocolate on the Olympic Park and get a behind the scenes pass to the Olympics. So these are things that actually were real highlights of my, of my life. Uh, the, the next picture at the top, that is the SAB Miller private jet, one of several uh, parked in uh, Nigeria uh, where we were refueling at Lagos airport. So again, an experience that I never thought I would ever have when I you know, chose to study chemical engineering you don't think you're going to be behind the scenes at the Olympics or flying around Africa uh, in a private jet. So you, you've got to take these opportunities when they come. On the bottom left, this is Poland. So this is a chewing gum factory that I was part of the team that built and, and set up and started it running. Uh, I'm really proud of that project. I spent three years living in Wrocław. I, I learned to speak Polish 
and uh, I did a lot of very interesting chemical engineering, as well as fully learning about a new culture uh, and making friends um, across the world in the expat community. Uh, the middle picture is actually a picture of a chewing gum mixture mixer that is tropical twist. And again, it's very interesting chemical engineering. My PhD is still here. This is a flow of a non-Newtonian viscous uh, fluid um, and uh, how it heats and cools and how the, the polymer chains all move is still very, very much chemical engineering. And then finally, uh, a picture of, of me and some of my team at Amazon uh, where the motto is work hard, have fun uh, and make history. And there's an awful lot of engineering behind the conveyors and sorters uh, that we use in our building. There's a lot of chemical engineering in the uh, heating, ventilating, and ventilation and air conditioning units. And we also have a lot of solar power, power, which again is actually chemical engineering. And I'm delighted to announce that for the winning team, I'm able to offer a behind the scenes tour of engineering at an Amazon facility. Uh, so, when we announce the winning team, I'll be in touch to, to set that up for you. And that's just a little bit about how uh, your career can go if you choose to study chemical engineering. None of this was planned. If you'd asked me back when I was at Cambridge, I probably would have said, actually, I want to go and work in the oil industry, the oil and gas industry. I didn't think of Cadbury in my childhood, adulthood love of chocolate. Certainly didn't think of uh, going to work for an alcohol company. And, you know, when I was at university, Amazon was, was, wasn't even really an online bookstore. So uh, the future is incredibly exciting. Uh, and I'm sure you're all going to have very exciting careers and, and futures ahead of you. And uh, thank you. That's what I wanted to say. Right, thank you, Rachel, uh, for your contribution. Um, that's very much appreciated. And to all the teams who have presented so far, we now have a break in the program. So um, please don't leave us, stay with us. Um, we will be back at five o'clock with the contribution from MP Nadim Sahawi. So um, please take a, a break, go and make yourself a cup of tea or oh, anything you like, and we will see you all back at five o'clock. Thank you. Good afternoon, Nadim Zahawi. Good afternoon. Oh, you're, you're on mute, I think. Hello, one, two, three, four. Can Hi, I could, we can hear you now. Perfect. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this webinar. We know you have a very busy schedule and we're very grateful for you to join us. Um, we have a very uh, um, diverse audience here. Most of them are school kids who are looking into uh, higher education as a, as a subject area uh, to study and they're looking, they're interested in chemical engineering as a subject area. So it'd be really great to hear from you. So without wasting any more of your time, I'll hand over to you, over to you. Thank you very much very much and uh, great to see you all and thank you for inviting me uh, today. Um, engineering is, I think, one of the best careers um, for anyone uh, to consider, not only because um, I think it teaches you many, many skills that you can then put to use uh, in a varied career as I have had, um, uh, but, but also it is incredibly um, fun because you begin to sort of understand how the world around you works, everything from how, you know, fluids would flow um, uh, as we take them for granted. Um, if, if you take a little piece of pipe, put f fluid through it, um, it's what yeah, a very famous uh, 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 chemical engineer, actually a family of great uh, geniuses, uh, the Bernoullis, uh, uh, thought about and studied and uh, taught us um, you know, the, 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 the real sort of uh, workings of uh, uh, fluid flow. Um, but for me, I think the most important thing it taught me uh, when I look at my career, whether uh, it's being at University College London and, and studying chemical engineering, uh, or of course my final project, 
or then in, in, in business and building a business and taking it public on the London Stock Exchange and uh, managing to take it around the world uh, in YouGov or as a minister now in the government responsible for vaccine uh, both supply uh, and it actually helps me to understand the manufacturing process uh, for vaccines and of course on the deployment side building the infrastructure to be able to deploy I think our record was 27 jabs a second uh, we've got this week is going to be a big week and next week is going to be an even bigger week probably hopefully uh, but um, what it does for you is it helps you understand um, basically big packets of information lots of data lots of lots of information and then focus on what information is really going to make a difference what information is material uh, to your day-to-day -day, um, success in whatever you're doing it helps you understand process so that you can get from where you are at point a to point b or z or z um, at the end of the process um, in the most efficient way possible uh, because it is what engineers do that's how an engineering mind tends to work and and you you learn that you you it's it's not sort of you know uh, genetic you you learn to think like an engineer and i think that's a great thing um i thought I'd, i'll tell you a little bit about my current challenge or um we're now sort of around about two thirds of the way through it. So it was a challenge, certainly it was a big challenge seven months ago, which is the vaccine deployment program. So we began uh, last uh, year uh, with having to audit uh, about 120 different teams around the world who were telling us that they can develop the, the vaccine uh, and then create a short list of about 24 and then bring that down to seven that we would then uh, contract with. So the Pfizer vaccine that we use, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine um, is a great uh, messenger RNA vaccine that we contract with. Uh, some of the components are made in the UK uh, and then are, are shipped out to Belgium and then it comes back as a finished product. Uh, and of course, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, where we actually invested in the research development, but also in the manufacturing of that vaccine uh, here in our own country in both Oxfordshire and in Braintree, uh, where we make about 80% of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And we've got two other vaccines that will come online, I hope once they receive approval that are also manufactured in the UK, the Novavax vaccine uh, in Teesside, uh, and uh, will be filled and finished at Barnard Castle, and then the Valneva vaccine in Scotland. So the challenge was to not just to discover, but then to also set up the manufacturing processes the manufacturing capability in the UK. Uh, we did that incredibly successfully. Uh, it is always challenging because like many of you, if you're thinking about an engineering uh, career, any manufacturing process, including a chemical engineering manufacturing process is challenging at the outset. It can be difficult to transfer the technology uh, from one team to the next team, uh, from one country to the next country. And we did that by transferring the technology, for example, from Oxford Biomedica to Halix in the Netherlands so they can serve us and the rest of Europe uh, and uh, uh, Oxford, Oxford team to uh, Catalan in America to manufacture the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine in the United States as well. Um, so a lot of challenges around that. It can be lumpy at the beginning and then it stabilizes and then you actually go back and uh, you process improve you create more efficiencies in the in the process, and you get you hopefully at the end of it get better yields out of that process. Uh, and we've done that with the vaccines. And then on the deployment side, uh, the challenge was we've never deployed. Uh, for example, the first vaccine we had, which required it to be moved at minus seventy degrees centigrade, uh, uh, so you needed cold chain. Uh, transport. This is the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. It has to be it had to be stored at minus seventy degrees centigrade and then thawed, and then stored in a fridge at two to eight degrees for five days initially. But now we found the our regulator allows us to store it for thirty days, so up to a month, which makes a huge difference to us. But nevertheless, we had never deployed a vaccination program at the scale of this vaccination program in our history, uh, and so we had to make sure that. Uh, we use 
everything available to us. And we brought three great institutions together, our NHS, so our doctors, our nurses, our GPs, the pharmacists, um, the 80,000 vaccinator volunteers who came back, whether they were retired or otherwise said, we can vaccinate. Uh, so then the St. John's Ambulance, a national voluntary service joining in um, to make sure we get another 200,000 volunteers as well uh, who help people in those cold winter months uh, uh, get to vaccination sites and uh, you know shepherd them through there as efficiently as possible. Uh, so a massive undertaking. We embedded our uh, armed forces into the vaccination program. Uh, 101 Logistics Brigade were normally tasked to get supplies to our armed forces on the front line in Lashkagar in Afghanistan or in Iraq or elsewhere. And they were embedded to essentially deal with the, this mega challenge at home of deploying the uh, vaccines. Local government uh, needed to find sites, identify sites and work with directors of public health, both on the vaccination program, but also on the test, trace and isolate as we're doing at the moment, as you probably can uh, see uh, on, on in, in the media, uh, in areas where we have variants of concern, like the B1617.2, the uh, so-called Indian variant, the one was first identified in India. Um, so a big, big um, uh, national effort uh, coming together to deploy. The infrastructure we built as Brigadier Phil Prosser, who's commander of 101 um, Logistics Brigade said to me, he said, it, uh, it's a bit like us standing up a national supermarket chain in about a month, Minister, and then we're going to grow it about 20% every week. And I said, that's right, uh, Phil, that's exactly what we are uh, going to do. And of course, you know, we had the challenge of the, the first vaccine, which we started deploying on the 8th of December with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the minus 70 degree movement vaccine. Um, and the team had to really believe that we can do that. So um, we, we brought in the private sector because we wanted to gain their knowledge. So the, the not only were they the manufacturers, but also the, the, the ability to move the logistics, the warehousing uh, uh, to get those uh, uh, vaccines in was uh, the, the distribution arm of Superdrug and Boots, the chemist, and then the pizza boxes that we deliver to GPs because the backbone of the uh, uh, vaccination program is, is GPs, primary care networks, we call them. So five or six GP practices coming together serving a population, patient population, about 50,000, 30 to 50,000. They decide who's gonna lead, the others would follow. So two thirds of the vaccination deployment goes through those primary care networks and they've done a brilliant job. Of course, we've got uh, the uh, national vaccination centers as well and the hospital hubs and pharmacy uh, as part of the whole portfolio of, of deployment. Um, but uh, the pizza boxes that arrive at GPs uh, for the primary care networks are delivered by DHL. And of course, we use technology to be able to assess our um, uh, deployment uh, and where we need to you know, focus more resource and understand how well we're doing. Uh, we brought in Palantir, the technology company, so we can see uh, in, a, in a forensic way by postcode what the uptake looks like uh, uh, amongst those populations and how well we're doing, where we can improve, uh, uh, in terms of uptake strategy, because we can't leave any community behind. Uh, because what we do know is, is this virus will uh, get desperate, it needs to survive, it needs to find unprotected people to infect uh, and mutate. Uh, and uh, when it does find those communities, it does go through them like wildfire, unfortunately, which is why we spend so much time on the uptake strategies, especially to, for you know, all communities in our country. Uh, it's been probably the most important job I I've done to date and probably I will ever do in my life uh, uh, to um, help my country, the country that's given me and my family everything. I was an immigrant to this country from Iraq in 1978, uh, where I was born, um, uh, to be able to put something back into the country that's given me everything. It is probably you know, the greatest privilege any human can, can, can have. Uh, thank you for listening to me. It's great to be with you. Uh, and uh, Absolutely, go for it if you're going to uh, go into engineering. It's a great career. Thank you so much, Nadim, for 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 your time and 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 your thoughts and and, how, and your experience of uh, how chemical engineering has uh, helped you progress through your career. We, we've had a, a couple of questions come up. There's one who's who, who started off by saying, "I've just had my second vaccine today. 
and thank you. And they said, how did your engineering background help you uh, with the UK vaccine rollout? What were the key things that you would say helped you, your, your skills in as a chemical engineer? Great question. I, I sort of tried to touch on it in my opening remarks, but it, it, it really is, you know, engineers understand process. Uh, engineers understand, um, you know, data and analytics and actually, you know, in a world now where um, there is so much information um, available to you, you've got to be able to very quickly analyze and decide what information is material to that process that you're trying to achieve, uh, you're trying to land uh, and get it done. Um, and the rest can wait. Some of it may be equally important, but you've got a little bit more time before you need to sort of analyze it, look at it and make a decision. Uh, and so one of the real strengths of, of engineers, I wish we had more engineers in government, uh, is, is the ability to uh, really, uh, you know, focus on what is material um, uh, and, and, and be able to make those decisions uh, when it's such a fast moving environment. You know, uh, everything is, it, it, you know, is changing pretty much all of the time um, with this pandemic. This is an invisible enemy. It's mutating all the time. Uh, it, it's, it's changing. And we had to react. You know, the only thing available to us last year was to any, any country. And, and you know, if the virus was designed to challenge liberal democracies, because the only thing available to, to a liberal democracy was the dreaded um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, the NPI, so, you know, which is basically taking people's freedoms away from them, because that's the only way we could s try and slow down the transmission of this virus. Uh, when we got the vaccines, the vaccines actually play to our, our strengths, I, I'm convinced. Now, many other nations have done really well, and it's great to see, and, and we have to share both vaccine supply and knowledge for those nations who are struggling. Uh, and we were the first country to lead COVAX. We've put 548 million uh, uh, pounds into COVAX to uh, manufacture a billion doses for low and middle income countries. The Oxford AstraZeneca team provided the vaccine. They've now manufactured 450 million doses at no profit uh, for low and middle income countries, uh, which is you know, incredible work. Pfizer uh, will do the same and, and deliver at cost for low and middle income countries. Um, but um, you know, ultimately, um, I think you know, having that, that ability to, to think clearly in a very difficult, fast moving situation, and when we got the vaccines was the real difference because it does play to our strength. You know, the, the, the four nations that are, make up the population of these isles, um, uh, are good at organizing. We demonstrated in the Olympics in 2012 a little bit. Uh, this is a whole quantum bigger. Uh, and I think we've demonstrated it again. We'll continue to do so. As I say, we are, we're probably about uh, two thirds of the way and, and you know, still still some time to go before I've protected the whole country. There's a question that's come up from one of the students um, um, who's from uh, secondary school. How did you decide what, what the gap between the two doses would be for each vaccination? Great question. So that decision is a clinical decision uh, and it's a public health decision. So when vaccine supply is uh, tight, it's finite, uh, you need to think uh, about protecting and stretching that protection as widely as possible uh, to as many people as possible. So Chris Whitty, our chief medical officer, his deputy, Jonathan Van Tam, working with the other chief medical officers of Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, took the decision to expand the dosing interval by looking at the data, obviously, provided by the manufacturers and saying that actually, you know, to essentially uh, double the, the, the volume we have to utilize by giving us a, a, a bit longer time, you're, you're, you're doubling the number of people you can vaccinate. And I remember him at the early press conference standing up there saying, no, you know, if you've got two doses uh, and a mum and a dad, and you want to protect you know, uh, your mum and dad, would you give both doses to your, to your mother and have her fully protected or give her one dose where you know she's getting probably 70, 80% protection and give the other one to your father uh, so that he can have the same thing? Uh, you know what the answer is. Uh, and of course, um, it is 
now been praised around the world as probably being one of the, the, the best things we ever did, as well as, by the way, having the brilliant people who make up the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization in our country. These are world experts, and we're just lucky to have them here in the UK, who gave us the priority list of how we vaccinate. Um, so, you know, phase one was nine categories, the, four, the top four, and they did all the research, all the evidence gathering, to tell us, you know, lots of, and we, we sent them lots of questions, you know, should we go by ethnicity, should we go by profession, people are being exposed uh, uh, to the virus in much greater, uh, you know, viral load, they looked at all of that and came back to actually it is predominantly age, uh, so we began with residents of care homes, uh, elderly residents of care homes, and those who look after them, and uh, the over 80s and, and uh, healthcare frontline staff, and the over 75s, over 70s, and then the clinically extremely vulnerable, uh, so one to four was 88% of mortality from this virus. And then one to nine, so nine being the over 50s, was 99% of, of mortality, which is why we're racing to try and get one to nine double dosed as quickly as possible now. And we've brought the dosing interval down to eight weeks because of the further evidence. Uh, uh, and the JCVI looked at this and obviously it's now been reinforced by the uh, real world data from Public Health England that two doses uh, work as well in protecting people uh, from infection uh, and even better from serious uh, illness and hospitalization for both AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccine, hence why we brought the dosing interval to eight weeks. Brilliant. Another question, this is from one of our academics at the, in the department, and they, they were asking, why do you think that there are so few scientists and engineers in the Houses of Parliament? Uh, what could be done to get more in? Um, I think, you know, scientists and engineers obviously spend a lot of time wanting to work in their sort of area of expertise, uh, and that's a great thing. Um, but I do think, you know, politics has, has been the domain to a large extent uh, of, uh, you know, PPE graduates, um, uh, so sort of, you know, non-engineering uh, background lawyers uh, and others and that's also a good thing you know you need to have a, a, a really uh, diversified uh, representative parliament that, that um, brings that sort of diversity of thought and of course a representation of the of, of the nation overall uh, but I do think we need uh, more engineers and I hope both myself and my colleague she she's in the red team uh, obviously, I'm in the blue team, but Chi Onwara, who's another engineer in, in, in Parliament, that we can encourage others as sort of role models that this is actually a, a, a great profession and you can then improve the way your countries run because you can apply all those great skills that engineers have uh, uh, to operationalizing what we need to do uh, 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 to make the country uh, run uh, you know, to, to the best of our ability. I, I mean, you've mentioned uh, a lot of um, uh, the information about all the challenges you've had in, in the rollout of the vaccination. Uh, moving forward, what sort of challenges do you still see that we need to worry about as a nation? Well, look, you know, there are still many challenges yet. You know, we're not out of the woods yet. We we set four tests, and I can see uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, questions in the chat um, that effectively drive our four-step uh, road to recovery, road to opening up our economy, getting our lives back. And the four tests uh, are vaccination continues at scale, big tick, that's happening. We've got a huge week this week, huge week next week, and we keep going. We're on target to offer at least one dose to every adult in the United Kingdom by the end of July. Um, and of course, the, 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 the two doses continue at, at eight week interval. Um, two, that the uh, vaccines continue to work. And again, you know, the good news is Public Health England data demonstrate that two doses uh, has an, you know, are equally effective against the B1617.2, which is the variant of, of, of most concern. There are other variants, of course, that we're keeping an eye on as well. Um, uh, so big tick, the vaccines seem to continue to uh, be efficacious. Three, uh, and this is really important, and it's in the chat, infection rates. We've got to continue to bear down on infection rates, which is why it's important that we all play our part 
in this in the sense that we're really careful as you know we're coming up to a big long bank holiday weekend the sun is shining you know spend more time uh, with your friends outdoors not indoors be careful you know wash your hands your hands face space um uh, and just follow that those the things that that would make complete sense to you in terms of wanting to slow this aerosol transmission uh, of the disease uh, of the virus uh, and then the th fourth test is va 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 variants of concern forgive me um, and we've got to keep a close eye on these variants uh, of concern uh, uh, and and make sure that that uh, we, you know we don't get blindsided by a variant so a lot of work continues as we continue to uh, vaccinate at scale. You know, we still have a challenge. If, uh, and I'll give you a, 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 an example of that as engineers on the school, would be engineers on the school. You know, if you have a vaccine that's 85% efficacious uh, and you get 85% penetration of all adults in the UK, that is only 72% uh, of people protected, right? And that's adults. That's not that's not children uh, in that. So so the virus still has quite a sizable population to go after, which is why we've got to get you know, as ambitious as we can be to vaccinate as many people as possible uh, of uh, uh, as many adults as possible as quickly as possible to try and make sure we're, we, we remain ahead of the virus. And then in the future, and I'm, I've got a big piece of work on this, uh, is that we're looking at booster shots in the autumn to just uh, you know, reinforce that protection for those uh, uh, you know, maybe th that got the vaccines very early on in December and in January being the, the most vulnerable cohorts. Um, and we, are, we have a, a, a big cl clinical trial at the moment of seven vaccines to see which one offers the best boost for the autumn, both in terms of increasing that uh, antibody immunity and, and uh, uh, T cell protection uh, but also if there is a variant that that is of concern and may escape the current vaccines we need to be ready with with uh, with vaccines that that can uh, capture that and work against it and then in future years uh, it, i hope we we will we will then move to a endemic stage from uh, where we are at the moment which is a pandemic in the world where we can treat this as we treat the flu uh, virus which will be an annual COVID vaccination and a flu vaccination program as well. Yeah. I mean, one thing, this question for me, it, it's um, it's sort of um, attitude towards vaccinations. Lots of people being hesitant, not coming forward. Um, and, and this, in the UK, it's not so bad, but in many countries abroad, it, it's quite bad. They don't they don't want to take the vaccination program. Um, so how, how do you see globally people coming together to try and bring some consistency in this? Very much so, Dr. Cameron. Uh, so um, you're absolutely right. Vaccine positivity in the UK is the highest in the world. I think the last piece of data I saw was standing at 90% of all adults say they will very likely or most likely take the vaccine or have already had the vaccine. Uh, now that's great. Um, it was when I took this job on, it was like 78%, 79% and has risen all the way through as people, as we, you know, we're now over 62 million you know, shots administered, uh, jabs administered. Um, uh, but nevertheless, we're not complacent because the, the 10 or 12% who are hesitant skew heavily towards um, ethnic minority groups. Uh, and, and, and there is a, a big, big task uh, that I launched back in February, on 30th February, the uptake strategy that's really begun to, to make a difference. So we've seen a five-fold increase amongst the Bangladeshi community, similar increases amongst the Pakistani community. We want to replicate that with the Black and Afro-Caribbean community because there's still a big gap there. Uh, and uh, so big piece of work uh, in that because the virus will find those communities, especially if they're tightly knit communities and will go through them like wildfire and we can't be bystanders allow that to happen. But you're also right, we've got to work with the rest of the world to make sure we get that vaccine positivity message through. And through our presidency of the G7, and you're going to hear more about that um, uh, at the beginning of June. So uh, on on the sort of first, second, and third of June, um, uh, uh, we are leading a campaign globally around uh, uh, vaccine, uh, it, you know, providing accurate, authentic 
information for people to make decisions about their vaccinations and combating uh, the disinformation and, and the uh, uh, fake news from anti-vax uh, campaigns. And we're doing that globally uh, in our uh, you know, G7 presidency, working with uh, both uh, you know, Harvard University and uh, uh, the Googles and Facebooks and uh, uh, the other networks around the world as well. And you're gonna see much more on that as part of our commitment to the world, as well as the, our commitment to COVAX. Yeah. Uh, Nadim Zawi, I know you're a very busy man, but I've got one more question and that's come up in the chat. Um, it's from someone, one of the audience members. So chemical manufacturing has been in decline over many years. Do you see the UK reestablishing a stronger manufacturing base that can employ our new engineers? I do, and I, I'm really excited about this because um, before taking on this, this uh, challenge uh, seven months ago, uh, uh, my focus was very much, because I'm the business and industry minister, that, that was sort of my day job. And then uh, Boris, the prime minister, rang up and said, right, I need you to focus on, on vaccine deployment uh, uh, because this is the largest vaccination program in the history of this country. And so my portfolio has been looked after by other ministers in the Department for Business energy and industrial strategy. But part of that was um, uh, my work with the chemical uh, sector. And we were working on a very ambitious um, uh, sector deal because actually we have quite a, a big and innovative and thriving sector. People think of the UK as no longer being a sort of country where manufacturing takes place. Actually, I would say to the contrary, um, you know, we're still the ninth largest manufacturer in the world. We've gone from being able to manufacture only 2% of our PPE to being able to manufacture 70% in the UK at profit and at, at value for money for uh, the NHS of our PPE uh, in the United Kingdom. And we've got some great companies here like Synthoma, who, who I think make something an incredible, I'm gonna get this wrong, but like something like three quarters of all the surgical gloves in the world uh, are made by, um, uh, Synthema. Um, so uh, we have some incredible companies, you know, Croda and lots of other companies um, who have done incredible things during this pandemic and in the chemicals industry. So we have a, a great future uh, uh, of the industry and we're looking to make sure that that continues and grows further because of the sort of the lessons around resilience, national resilience, not nationalism, but national resilience, i.e., of course, we've got to make sure you know, many components in an engineering process can come from many different countries. Uh, but it's important that, that you know, what was driven home to us is the ability. I mentioned PPE. Uh, same again with, with diagnostics. We could only uh, conduct about 2,000 tests a day in the UK. Uh, we got to 1.9 million uh, when schools went back by just... Uh, uh, in encouraging and, in, and investing in diagnostics capability in the United Kingdom. Zawi, thank you so much for your time. I, I know you're a very busy man and we promise to only take up half an hour of your time. I'm really very grateful for you awesome. to join the call. And thank you so much. You're, you're a true inspiration and role model for, for students who would like to go on to, to do a career in chemical engineering. Thank you so much. You will never regret it. Go for it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks. Okay, guys, thank you so much uh, for everyone's questions. There were quite a few questions there. Uh, I, sorry if I didn't get through everyone's questions that were asked. Um, I can see Andy's hands up. Andy Simmons, is there something I needed to add? No, sorry, apologies. All right, okay. I think we're now going to move on to the final stage of our program. I'm going to hand over to Professor uh, Stephen Richardson, who's the um, uh, president for the ICME. Um, so over to you, uh, uh, Professor Richardson. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I've got, uh, I suppose, what's the sort of a graveyard shift right at the end of this. But uh, fortunately, there's a, a really big plus at the end when I can announce the, uh, the winner of the Davidson, Davidson Inventors Challenge. 
I'm really pleased to be able to address you all. Um, my background is Imperial College, but I did spend some time in Cambridge. In fact, when Peter was a, a student still, and I got to know his father, who's shown the same photograph, I think, as Peter himself used uh, at the bottom left of this photograph here. Um, and I've known him ever since. And he came into my life at a very formative period and was a, a, a great bonus to me. Uh, we seem to be shifting around on the slides there. Um, on the bottom right, there are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I think almost everybody in the audience here will know everything about those. I'm not going to go through those, but if I can go to my second slide, please. What I'm going to do is talk about some challenges and indeed opportunities and some real excitement for chemical engineers. I'm going to start off in the middle with a picture of the Flixborough plant, which uh, went bang in 1974, and Peter has already mentioned that. John Davidson was one of the panel, the Court of Inquiry, that actually looked into this accident. And their report that they produced all those years ago was really, really formative on the way chemical engineering plant safety was viewed in the UK and eventually worldwide. It simply made a sea change in how things were viewed and how chemical engineers operate and how they do their job. And now it's second nature for chemical engineers. Chemical engineers don't do safety as an add-on. They do it as part of the everyday job. And what I think we need to move towards is making some of the other challenges, particularly around the sustainable development goals, equally part of everyday life. They're not something you add on at the end or you have to think about, it's just normal. It's what you do all the time. And I've got four pictures here, which are just picked out from four of the potentially sustainable development goals. The bottom left-hand one is not, but uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and we've heard a lot today about all of these here in many different ways. The top one, of course, is the rather fanciful picture. Top left is the rather fanciful picture of a COVID virus. And um, it is quite clear that chemical engineers, while possibly not contributing to uh, creating some of the vaccines in the first place, have certainly had an enormous role in their mass production. But also there are all sorts of other things that we've heard about. Um, and uh, know about in terms of PPE. And what was really interesting to hear today was from Admeliora about their potato-based um, face masks and also scheme about panoxy. There are lots of challenges, opportunities, excitement for chemical engineers in actually bringing medicine out to actually be something that the whole world can use. Clean, sensible, good stuff there at a reasonable price that the world can afford. The top right is a picture of some clouds, which is as near as I could get to the whole issue around climate change. And of course, that's everybody's responsibility. Uh, COVID is, of course, the, uh, the, the topic of the day, but climate change potentially is a very much bigger thing. It could affect all of us, it's really, really significant numbers. And chemical engineers, are clearly going to be contributing significantly to that. And I think some of the stuff we saw from uh, about energy production, and therefore the geo better as uh, geo battery was uh, really important and really exciting and interesting to see there. Coming down from there to the bottom right is a picture of some water droplets there. Uh, I think John Davidson might have quite liked that picture. It's the sort of picture I thought that might, might uh, he might appreciate. It is my contention, and uh, it's uh, effectively what hydroponics have been uh, talking about today, that clean water and disposal of sewage saves more human lives than doctors ever have. Uh, that's slightly contentious, and I normally only say it to doctors just to wind them up a little bit, but I think chemical engineers and civil engineers who are primarily responsible for clean water really have enormous opportunities here in all sorts of parts of the world. This is going to be something that lives with us long after petroleum is a, a long dead issue. On the bottom left, there's a picture which is my representation, so to speak, of digitalization. And it's about how everything is going to be viewed and operated and run in a completely new way. Um, my grandson, my second grandson, when he was two, got most of my password right. He got all eight digits or all eight characters right. He just got the first four completely right and the other ones as an anagram. Now he's eight 
And when I get into a problem on my computer, I ask him what I have to do. And he just does it because it's natural for him. And I think that natural behavior, natural reaction is going to be something that is going to be important for all of you. And I know you're all going to embrace it. But you haven't come here today to listen to me. You've actually come here to listen to who's going to be the winners. So if I go to my final slide, please. What we're going to come to is the Davidson Inventors Channel Challenge winners. And the, um, the, the rubric there is for demonstrating excellent, excellent understanding of the sustainable development goals. And I think all four groups that we've heard today have absolutely shown that. It's outstanding use of chemical engineering skills and innovation. And I think you've all absolutely demonstrated that as well. And presenting the most inventive and sustainable solution. And I'm going to say yet again, you've all demonstrated that very, very well indeed. And of course, that then means we have four stunning submissions, all of which I really enjoyed listening to. And it was really tough to decide on the winners. But winners there are. And the, uh, the view of the judging panel is that in what I might call joint second place are GeoBetter, Hydroponics and Scheme, all absolutely stunning presentations, bits of work and everything. But from that, you can deduce that the winner is Ad Meliora. And if my camera is still working, you might be able to see the certificate there, which they will be getting properly through the post in due course. So many congratulations, many, many congratulations to all of you and particularly to Ad Meliora. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Richardson um, and congratulations to Ad Meliora for, for winning the competition. Um, uh, and um, uh, like uh, Professor Richardson said, you all were fantastic and it was a really close call between all of the um, uh, presenting teams. Um, uh, really, it's just to kind of um, uh, wrap up the session now. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Uh, thank you for all your participation uh, on all the questions we've received on, 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 on the webinar. It's been fantastic to, to see so much engagement there. Uh, I hope everyone has found this, um, this, uh, this webinar interesting and enjoyed attending the webinar. Um, we will be in touch with all the teams to give you some feedback as well and um, we'll be in touch with the winning team with providing you with your certificates and further details about uh, the, uh, the, your hopefully your visit to Cambridge University. Okay I think uh, I think we've covered everything here. Andy uh, Clemens is there anything else that we can... I would just like to 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 finish uh, briefly um, thanking all of you um, the students for the brilliant presentations. This really made my day today uh, a, a really nice way to finish the week. Um, I would also like to thank our presenters. Um, th these were very busy, very important people. Um, it, it was fantastic and I hope inspiring for you um, to see what you can do if you uh, embark on a career in chemical engineering. I wish you all the best um, in your the students in your in your future endeavors. I'm sure you're going to be brilliant scientists, and you are going to tackle big challenges as they come. Um, and you will be equipped to do so well if you choose to study our discipline. Uh, thank you, Cam, and uh, thank you, Elena, again, and thank you all the judges in the panel uh, for making such an enjoyable and and useful event. <laughs>